Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the June 2020 meeting of the Food Standards Agency. This is a virtual meeting of the FSA board, as you can see. Our members and officials are joining us from across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. For the record, the meeting is taking place where I am, which is in Arncliffe in North Yorkshire. I recommend it for a holiday as soon as you're allowed them. We have no apologies for this meeting. We are going to take a, fifth, a 10 minute break in proceedings after we've heard our Chief Scientific Advisor's report. Not a moment longer, board members. And this is Professor Guy Poppy, our Chief Scientific Advisor's last meeting. So we'll be saying more about that in any other business at the end of our board meeting. Robin May, who's been appointed as our new Chief Scientific Advisor, is, I know, watching our meeting today, and we're looking forward to welcoming, welcoming him to his new role next month. Could I ask board members, is there any other business that they wish to add to the agenda? Now, in which case, I would like to start uh, by recording that the board's last scheduled meeting took place in March. It was just days before the full horror of the coronavirus crisis struck. On behalf of the board, I'd like to start this meeting with our heartfelt thanks to the hundreds of thousands of people who work in the food and feed industries for their determination and commitment to sustaining the supply of safe and accessible food for consumers. We're immensely grateful to our own staff who have shown remarkable resilience in switching roles, going back into frontline duties, working very long hours, seven days a week, to ensure that everybody involved had the support that they needed to keep food safe and trustworthy in the midst of such upheaval. I think we'd especially recognise the contribution made by our frontline colleagues and the staff of our main contractor, Evelyn Jones, and those of Deira in Northern Ireland, who've played a critical role in keeping the meat sector running. Local authority officers, our independent scientific advisors, port health officials, all have had to adjust, react, take urgent and pragmatic decisions and cope with the uncertainties and risk caused by COVID-19. And the people who work in the food and feed sector, which we should remember is the country's largest manufacturing sector and a critically important retail sector. Those people have done an outstanding job in keeping food on the shelves, factories running, supply chains and logistics taking enormous strain and altering their businesses, large and small, to meet consumer needs especially for our most vulnerable. So on behalf of the board, we would like to record our deep and heartfelt thanks to you for that. And now going to turn to our Director of Communications, Stephen Pollock, who will read out the questions that we've received from members of the public in advance of this meeting. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, board, and good morning to those watching online. Um, we've received four questions in total from the public. Two are the same question. I'll start with the first submitted by Paula Wilkinson of an organisation called Mums Bake Cakes. With a six-fold increase in people looking to start a baking business from home and potentially many redundancies, what campaign is planned to ensure the public is aware that these food businesses need to be registered, both consumers to check and potential businesses to be told? Can an anonymous email address be set up where unregistered traders can be sent through so the relevant councils can contact them to help them comply? The second question is two questions. It's a, the same question asked by two individuals. One is a member of the public called Mohammed Amir, and the second is Roxana Shain, who is a representative of a Muslim consumer organization and works with mosque organizations. The question are related to the Islamic ritual of Kurbani, which is part of the Eid festival. And the question is, will the FSA, like the French authorities, put religious freedom before strict adherence of EU rules and allow Muslims to collect inspected and health-marked meat from both butcher shops and slaughterhouses during the festival of Eid without strictly adhering to the EU rules of chilling down at an approved premises? So that was the same question asked by both Mohammed Amir and Roxana Shain. The fourth and final question was submitted by an anonymous member of the public. Questions to the FSA board and subsequent answers from the board are not made public. Qu 
questions put to the board in the previous meeting in March were not directly discussed during the course of the meeting. The Advisory Committee on Novel Foods and Processes, public consultations and responses are not made public. It is quoted, the ACNFP asks for public comments on its draft opinions. All views and comments will be made available for public examination as part of the committee's consideration of the notification. Why are appropriate procedures not followed? In the interests of consumers, why is this information still not publicly available? And please publish ACNFP consultations, starting with Theobroma Cacao. And that concludes the questions from the public, Jill. Stephen, thank you for that. I think the questions from Paula, we might pick up in the paper on COVID-19, and then as usual, she'll get a full response directly after the meeting. Uh, the comments, uh, questions from Mohammed and Ruxana, I think uh, will be picked up in the CEO's report, which touches on the issue of Kobani. And the anonymous questions, um, I just thought I would record that we changed our process about 12 months ago so that questions in advance from members of the public or interested parties are shared with the board and the exec team like this at the start of the meeting. So, and the point of that is so that we can pick up and reflect those questions during the conversation and, and the board discussion. It's an important way of ensuring the board are aware of any of those sorts of concerns. Um, if there isn't a relevant agenda item where that might happen or where the question is very specific and requires a more detailed response, um, then that might not be possible. And in any case, we always give the question or an answer after the board meeting and we do publish them. However, since that question came in, I've just checked and we don't publish them quickly enough. Um, so I agree that waiting until the minutes of the next board meeting are published, which is what is happening at the moment, is too long to wait. Um, so we're going to set a target now of publishing the answer within two weeks of it being asked at the board meeting. Um, and once, it's, once the answer has been given to the person who asked the question, in, in this case, it's anonymous, so we'll just have to publish it. And we'll track that to make sure that it happens. So I'm grateful to the questioner for pointing out that that time lag is too long and shouldn't be happening. Um, and on the specific points about the um, uh, Advisory Committee on Novel Foods and Processes, um, we'll just have to double check what's been happening there, but there's no reason we can see why there has not been publication of those uh, issues. So we'll confirm the process there to make sure it's in line with our commitment to openness and transparency, and again, give a full report on that. So it's incredibly important to this board that what we do is in the open and the way we operate is open and transparent. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you've pointed out that that delay just isn't necessary and we will address it. Thank you very much indeed. Moving on now to the minutes of our board meeting on the 11th of March, which feels a bit like it took place in a parallel universe. Uh, board members have seen these in uh, draft already and had a chance to comment. Uh, are we happy now to agree that these are a, record, a correct record of our meeting? Yes, good, thank you very much. Um, and the actions arising from that meeting, uh, did board members wish to pick up anything on the list of actions? Clearly, some of these things have been impacted by the diversion of resources onto COVID-19. So anything anybody wished to pick up, otherwise we will continue to monitor progress on those through our future board discussions. Now, in which case, uh, let me turn to my report to the board. And I am delighted to bre uh, begin this report by confirming that our new deputy chair has been appointed as of uh, the announcement was yesterday. So Ruth Hussey, already very well known to all of us on the board because she's been our board member for Wales, has been appointed, which I know we all are absolutely delighted about. And welcome to your new role, Ruth, which begins at the beginning of July. Thank you. And I understand that ministers intend very soon to launch the competition to recruit my successor as chair of the FSA. The recruitment process for our new Wales board member was suspended because of COVID-19, but will soon conclude. Uh, ministers in Northern Ireland, I'm delighted to say, um, have extended the appointment of Colm McKenna as our Northern Ireland board member, and we're really grateful to Colm for agreeing to extend his service to the FSA. And that's an indefinite appointment until it's possible to regroup on a longer term recruitment process. I'd also like to put on record that an extraordinary board meeting was convened at very short notice 
on Wednesday the 8th of April. This was because a, an urgent legal issue had arisen in relation to labelling in the light of COVID-19 uh, implications. Uh, the issue was a matter for the CEO, but she uh, sought board guidance on handling. Following this board meeting, we will publish the paper and the minute of that meeting, but please note that the legal advice will not be published as is normal. The issue at hand, which was about easements on labelling regulations, is reported in the paper on COVID-19, which we are going to discuss this morning. So that is in the public domain. I'd also like to put on the record that in the light of advice on working arrangements as a result of COVID-19, uh, we've updated the way we're going to meet as a board for the rest of 2020. From now onwards, all our board and business committee meetings will be conducted online until the end of this year. And that follows government advice on working from home. I'm conscious that board members and officials are across the, almost the whole of the UK and have to travel. So it seemed to us the best way of ensuring that everyone has the same opportunity to participate. Of course, we will continue to live stream our meetings. We are looking for ways to enable public questions to happen as they do in our normal board meetings uh, uh, in person. Because it is uh, rather a strain to stare at a screen and many faces for us all for our normal length of board meetings, which can start at 8.30 in the morning and finish at two or three in the afternoon, we've decided to hold more meetings, but each event will be for a maximum of two and a half hours. So all those scheduled meetings are on our website and more information about agendas will be released uh, closer to time as we normally do. In terms of my engagement since the board last met in March, a full list of those is on our website. I was glad to be invited to join the Ministerial Task Force on the Supply of Food for Vulnerable People. That's chaired by Victoria Prentice MP, who's the Minister for Food at DEFRA, and includes ministers from each of the devolved nations. The FSA has contributed consumer insight and survey data to that task force. And within the next week, we'll publish our COVID-19 tracker survey results for the early part of the pandemic. That's been a very useful input to the work of that task force, as well as giving us a useful source of evidence about issues for the FSA in looking at our short to medium term response to the pandemic. Together with the CEO, I've held meetings with retailers and with leaders of the meat industry in the early stages of the pandemic and with Lord Gardner, the Minister in DEFRA, on challenges in the meat sector as the crisis unfolded. I attended a meeting of the Food and Drink Sector Council, which focused on recovery plans for the COVID-19 crisis and on plans for EU transition at the end of the year. Colm and I were really pleased to have our first meeting with Edwin Poots, Minister in Northern Ireland, the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and we'll share our feedback on that in the relevant papers through the course of today's discussion. I've also had a meeting with the Chief Executive. Uh, we met with uh, Minister Prentice again at DEFRA to talk about the FAS, FSA's role in relation to food safety and standards after EU transition. And I've had an introductory meeting with Alex Norris MP, who was appointed Shadow Minister for the Labour Party for Public Health. And although it's not already happened, I just want to record that this afternoon I've got a meeting with Joe Churchill MP, who's the Minister for Public Health and the Department of Health and Social Care. As board members know, uh, to support the parliamentary debate there's been on the England Agriculture Bill, I wrote to MPs and interested peers explaining the role of the FSA and how we will operate in protecting public health and consumer in interests outside the UK. Do board members have any questions on that or anything else that they wish to ask me? In which case, I shall hand over to Emily for her Chief Executive's report. Thank you, Heather. Um, good morning, everybody, and good morning to those of you who are watching online. Um, so, first of all, just to say uh, I and the FSA very much appreciate the thanks that you've offered us today for the COVID-19 effort. Um, it has, it seems astonishing that um, it was the 11th of March that we last met. It was on the 17th of March that around 700 of our staff who were um, mainly office-based started working from home. And also um, on the 24th of March, when lockdown really started, um, our meat hygiene inspectors and the official vets that we contract with have been going into work all of that time. So the organisation has very much felt like it's been in two parts. Um, and the, the flexibility, the commitment, 
um, the support that I have seen around the organisation for the last um, three months has just been um, breathtaking and really impressive. Um, we have had to do significant changes of direction in various ways, and we'll come to that later in the agenda. Um, the Chief Executive Report is really a, a capping report for the agenda. It sort of tantalises you with a couple of subjects that actually we've got agenda items on. Um, so I, I won't um, I won't give many comments now on COVID-19. In fact, I've, I've made the ones I want to make or on EU exit and trade, where there, I think we do have something to say about the FSA role. We'll come to that on other items. Um, and then even the, the updates on programmes, we have the prioritisation uh, item at the end of the business committee, um, which we can talk in more detail on there. But just to, to mention on our non-COVID-19 work, so COVID-19 has dominated the life of the agency over the last three months, and we have had to put a number of things on hold and pivot um, resource and attention to what's been urgent and important in relation to the pandemic. But we have, um, we have continued uh, in other areas. So just to run through on operations transformation, actually, because we've had to do some easements to be ready for working with fewer staff, with the possibility of um, fewer staff, uh, we have had a bit of a taste of the future and we hope that that learning is going to accelerate our programme on operations transformation. Secondly, on the Achieving Business Compliance programme, which is the successor to the Regulating Our Future programme, the work we were doing to uh, scope the refresh of the programme got significantly slowed by COVID-19 because the resource that we have and that is expert and focused on local authorities has had to focus on, on that. But we have continued work on um, platforms, uh, so digital platforms. Um, I've met with Amazon uh, with, and had a productive meeting. We've also met with Facebook, which was slightly less productive. Um, and we are, um, so we're furthering our work thinking how, as a regulator, we can effectively really insert ourselves into, into those spaces um, and have quite an aggregated effect on the food industry in the same way that we've managed with um, Just Eat and Deliveroo and others. Um, our surveillance work continues. We do real-time surveillance um, in terms of consumer insight and changes to the food industry for COVID-19. But also we've been developing our signal prioritisation system for imports, um, and that has continued. And then at the end of my re report, I turn to three matters that are really to do with um, implementation. So um, first of all, incidents we saw a drop in food incidents in the first few weeks um, after the lockdown started, which worried us slightly, but it's now starting to pick up. We, it worried us because we were concerned that, that possibly there were incidents that weren't being reported to us. Actually, now we've done some digging, we think that um, the drop was consistent with the type of consumption that was going on. Um, so that's mentioned in the report. Secondly, um, NFCU investigations continue, and there's a bit more detail in the report about that. And then thirdly, this issue about Kobani, um, so to, to mention that, th this is um, part of the Eid festival uh, over a particular um, couple of days. Uh, there is a question about direct sales to consumers um, from abattoirs of meat that's not necessarily chilled. Um, the, the law got changed in 2017. We gave a grace period until 2019 about whether you, you could um, have carcasses that were not chilled. Um, we have, uh, and so in effect, this is a decision about how to implement the law. It's a chief executive's decision. But I was keen for the board to be aware of what we were doing. Um, this year, we have required, if, if a food business is supplying to another food business, we've required that, um, that the meat must be chilled. But for direct sale to the consumer, which is incredibly rare from a slaughterhouse, and obviously it happens through butcher shops, um, which are regulated by local authorities, um, we've been working with our partnership working group with the meat industry and this year we are basically saying if people uh, are going to not implement the law about chilling they need to get permission from us and there are a number of mitigations that we're asking to, to have put in place um, particularly around traceability of the purchase health warnings and consumer advice and uh, evidence of micro sampling in the avatar but Rebecca can say more about that if anyone's got any questions um, and Kobani this year is likely to be at the end of July. It's a big uh, moment for us as an agency because um, resource pressures on uh, on our um, operations function go up at that point. So we are preparing carefully. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Emily, thank you very much. I am looking to see if any board members have got their hands up. Mark has. Uh, Mark and then Colm. 
Thank you, Heather. Um, I just wanted to start, if I may, uh, Heather, you started the meeting by, by thanking everyone involved in the food industry. I just wanted to be specific, if I may, uh, and thank Emily and the, our senior colleagues at the FSA uh, for their hard work and leadership over this period. It's been a tough uh, gig for all of them and just wanted to recognise that, that we, we see that and thank you for it. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I may. I'll, I'll fire them all off, Emily, in the hope that you can deal with them all in one go. Um, I should know the answer to this, but you mentioned in your report the Competency Reference Group. Uh, I wonder if you can just remind us who, who participates in that. Um, you also mentioned in your report in surveillance uh, an interactive dashboard and the fact that uh, it's going to be made available to FSA teams uh, and the NFCU. I just wonder if there's any aspiration to make it more widely available uh, to all those delivering official controls. Um, my last question is around the, your, your report and the NFCU uh, element of that. Uh, and note that, that you're proposing a particular timescale for the review into the NFCU. Uh, I can see your logic in terms of it being three years after it achieved its viability. Um, I'm not sure that the, that the question around the relatively few cases uh, is going to be that helpful because I, I don't think another nine months is going to add a huge number of cases uh, to that list. Some of these cases can take uh, years, literally years, to, to come to fruition. Um, but I wonder if you could just say a few words around uh, the sort of day-to-day -day governance, uh, just to, to give us reassurance that actually the work of the NS NFCU is uh, going to meet our aspirations for the level of protection it should be offering to consumers, uh, and that it's you know it's it, it's not operating in, in a bubble that it's you know it, making its contribution as we would hope it should be. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take questions from Colin as well, and then Emily. You, you and colleagues can come back on that. Colin. Uh, Chair, thank you. And Emily, thank you very much for the report. Uh, and if I can add to, uh, to Mark and, and the Chair's uh, comments earlier about the tremendous work uh, that has been done by the FSA in getting this to where we are and supported in Northern Ireland by our colleagues in Dara. Um, at, at our, our, I have just one question, and it's really in relation to the discussions we had at our March board meeting. We were updated about the ongoing dialogue between ourselves and the the National Farmers Union in relation to this Commission on Food Standards post-EU exit. Uh, I did note from your, your stakeholder engagement piece uh, that you did meet with somebody from the NFU. I'm just wondering where we are on that uh, and how we, we ensure that we avoid confusion as we move forward into 2021. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Emily, but Colm, I think we... Can we hold the standards piece and pick that up in the paper subsequently? Would that be all right if we revert to that? Because I think it sits together well there. Emily. Thank, thank you. And I'm going to, um, to ask my colleagues to come in to answer some of these. So um, uh, as if Maria could respond on the competency reference group, uh, that would be helpful. On the surveillance um, interactive dashboard, yes, we do have an ambition to make that more available. But um, Julie can say a bit more about where we've got to on that. And on the review of NFCU and the day-to-day -day governance, so um, it sits under our operations director. So Martin is currently responsible. Um, Colin would usually be responsible. Um, I touch it time to time. So I had a meeting with Darren uh, Davis, the head of NFCU, um, a few weeks ago just to check in on what they were doing. Um, and uh, it, it is making the progress it's making. It has a pipeline of good cases. Um, it's building its skill set. Uh, um, it, it lacks the pace powers that we've been pushing for, but it, is, it has found a number of workarounds um, working with uh, police forces to make sure that we can do things like interview people under warrant. Um, so it's making the progress we would expect, but I, uh, Martin Evans may want to say a bit more. Um, so if that's all right, Chair. Thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah, that's a really important point. And Mark, the point you raised earlier on about some of these cases can go on for a significant period of time. You're absolutely right. I'm new to looking after the food crime unit covering for Colin, and I'm spending an awful lot of my time talking to Darren Davies, who leads the food, uh, food crime unit. And there is an enormous wealth of cases that are currently in that pipeline, and some are really high profile that you will have heard of. And it's just a case and a question of them coming down that pipe and them being a focus of attention on delivering what they want to do. So Emily's quite right. They're still in that. They're building and looking for their, their capability and their competence in different areas. But there's, it's a very exciting time for a food crime unit. And eventually it will all become 
as it trickles out and then and they deliver what they're focused on, I think you'll be really impressed with uh, the capability and the capacity and what they're looking to deliver. So it's one to watch for the future. I think I'd just add something to that if I may, Martin. And by the way, first of all, uh, thank you for still being here rather than being retired, as was your plan, and being here as a, a, a director of operations, which definitely wasn't your plan. Thank um, you, so Thank you. Um, the reason we put the review in, board members who've uh, been around a while will recall, was partly because we wanted to know that the powers that we'd hopefully achieved by then were the right powers and we're using them the right way. Um, and we've always been concerned as a board about the, uh, the balance between the NFCU being a full and integral part of, of the FSA or it being at greater length from the FSA, would that give it more operational freedom? But would there be concerns about then its, um, its accountability and how we would uh, ensure it was focused in the right area? Um, and when the review was put in, it, it was significantly to review whether the structural solution that we'd come up with was the right one. And in the absence of still being given the pace powers that we need for the NFCU, um, I have agreed with Emily from my perspective that it, it's too early to do that full um, uh, review in terms of how we got the structure right. But I don't think that's a substitute for the general scrutiny by this board of the way in which the, FS, the NFCU is discharging its duties and the impact that it's having. And the annual reports that we get on the NFCU are absolutely critical to our ability to be able to judge that the resources are appropriate uh, we are in the stage we are because we felt in phase one the NFCU was uh, being expected to achieve uh, all kinds of outcomes when it had only an intelligence gathering capability. Being able to move to a more investigative stance is really important to tackling food crime in the specialised way that we've all recognised is needed and that the Elliott Review uh, recognised and uh, that David Kennedy's follow-up uh, endorsed but we are still in a situation where without having the pace powers, we can't complete that job entirely. And so we're in a little bit of a, a holding pattern on that. It, it might be if something happens to give us the pace powers quickly, then it will be the right time to review it a little bit earlier. But for now, I think the review shouldn't be confused with us as a board being confident that we can hold the NFCU to account through our normal practices and particularly through the annual report to the board. Is that helpful mark and giving you some reassurance yeah absolutely thank you Heather. obviously i wasn't party to the original uh, no. discussions at, at the board for this and that's really helpful thank you thanks ever so much uh, maria do you want to pick up the uh, points about uh, the um marks of the points i can't remember what it was but it was definitely for you to answer thanks heather yes um the competency reference group um, and the competency reference group is made up of representatives from the chartered institute of environmental health the Chartered Trade and Standards Institute, um, those academics who are delivering programmes in universities and also representatives from local authorities and the industry as well. So it's quite a broad reaching group. And then it was duly on the strategic scales. Yes, thank you. Um, for all of the um, surveillance services, our default position is, is to um, publish uh, and to make available um, those services. Um, and, and this particular one will um, go through our formal standard process um, to ensure that there is value in making it available and um, we are able to, from the point of view of data ownership, privacy, et cetera. Um, so this service will go through exactly that process, um, but I hope it will be um, widely available for those that can make uh, use of it. Thanks, Julie. Anything else coming back on that from board members or any other points for the chief executive? In which case, uh, we will move on to the report to the board on the FSA's response to COVID-19, uh, which Emily is going to lead. Thank you again, Chair. Um, so I'll start, and then I think Colin Sullivan as our incident director is going to pick up, and then Philip Randalls um, is going to supplement as well, who is um, head of the incident team. Um, so, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, it's been a, a quite an intense period for us as an agency. 
Um, our strategic in intent has been to ensure food safety um, and to support the industry in maintaining food supply because we think this is in the consumer interest. And then also to make sure that other consumer interests are reflected into government um, as decisions get made. Um, just in very broad brush, uh, three main areas of activity. So scientific risk assessment. Um, so for example, the uh, view that it's incredibly low risk that you might get COVID-19 from food. Um, we've been heavily involved in coming to that view. Um, secondly, communications for public and business. Um, but, uh, and we've done a lot on that uh, to help businesses, for example, who are restarting um, access materials in an easy way with the principle being let's try and make it as easy as possible for businesses to do the right thing. But also information for consumers um, about, you know, if, if they've got more food in their fridge, if uh, things are going to be on their sell by date, how can we um, help consumers do the right thing there? And then thirdly, some easements mainly because uh, easements to official controls or, or rules, um, often because of um, limitations around uh, labour. So um, this has been on official controls uh, in uh, meat establishments where we've, for example, been swapping out who can do the control to try and um, make it more flexible. Um, we, uh, we've also done a little on uh, labelling, which the chair referred to, but um, Colin and um, uh, Philip will go into more detail. Um, on the meat hygiene controls, which has been a huge area of our um, of our activity in terms of running operations, I just really wanted to pay tribute to the meat industry because the quality and level of collaboration that we have had with them over the last three months has been really, really good. Um, and uh, we've been talking to them on off on a daily basis, sometimes several times a day, about how we're running um, our meat hygiene inspection, but also on some of the policy questions that we're having to resolve quite quickly. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to flag was just the flexibility commitment of our own staff, particularly um, those who are on the front line. Um, we have internally been doing a campaign called um, Hidden Heroes. And this, this, it's not come from a kind of, uh, it, it's come from a genuine sense of gratitude and admiration to our colleagues who are doing that work. Um, my colleague Paul Morrison has often uses this phrase, which is that COVID-19 has been a bit like a barium meal for the country um, and a, a barium meal that shows you what's working and what's not working. And I think for the Food Standards Agency, um, what has worked has been uh, some of the things I've described. So the awesome commitment of people like um, those who've been staffing our briefing cell, the lawyers who've done extraordinary work at short notice, our meat hygiene inspectors, our corporate support unit who've been distributing um, PPE, it's been coming into our office in York and they've been packaging it up and sending it out to abattoirs um, at much higher volumes than usual. Just incredible commitment. Um, uh, what else has gone well? So food is safe. We don't think there's been a food safety incident that's been caused by COVID-19. Um, we've improved our horizon scanning capability, various things that will come out in the report. We, we also think there are things that um, could have gone better uh, and we've listed those in paragraph 4.5 and we also put these in our return to the FRS Select Committee. Um, so in terms of our contingency planning, we had prepared for possibly 20% staff absence, but we hadn't prepared for social distancing at work. And when that came in, because at the time everyone assumed if you had symptoms, you would stay home. Um, we had to work very quickly with the meat industry to try and find a way through that. Uh, we've had to improve quickly getting real-time consumer insight. I'm now pleased with the capability we've got, but it um, took us a few weeks. And then working across four nations to make swift decisions on devolved matters has sometimes felt clunky. And um, we've got there, again, very, very good work on the part of everyone. And then the fact is that the EU food law that we operate is pretty inflexible and doesn't have the safety valves that you would expect um, for a crisis. So I hope that's something that government will turn its attention to in due course to give us something that we can um, use more flexibly. Um, Colin will say more about looking forward, but just looking ahead to the next few months, it feels like a marathon, not a sprint now. It felt like a sprint at the start. Um, we're looking where, at where we can do double duty. So where we can, um, because COVID-19 is requiring things to change, we can use that to accelerate other reforms that we had in mind. Um, and then obviously there's particular issues around the hospitality sector who are going to be pretty hard hit um, and who haven't yet reopened. Um, and we're, we're very alive to that and want to do what we can to support. Um, but that was what I wanted to say by way of introduction. And then I'll hand over to Colin. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Emily, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, um, as Emily has said, um, uh, we, we've taken a structured approach to the incident, and I'll run through a number of things that we've, we've undertaken. But in terms of the principles that have underpinned our approach, um, they're highlighted in the paper in uh, paragraph 2.2. In terms of the uh, scientific assessment, uh, Emily pointed out to the very low risk of transmission uh, of COVID through uh, consumption of hand or handling of food. Um, and that, that's an assessment that we keep under review, uh, but there are no known cases linked to food to date. And that was something we published relatively early uh, on the 26th of March. Um, communications and engagement uh, have been a key element to our response. Um, the FSA's central communications objective has been to ensure that consumers, uh, food businesses, local authorities, and uh, port health authorities have been up to date uh, uh, with accurate and useful information. Um, and we've, um, we've sought to support industry in maintaining food supply through regular engagement. And that's, that's been helpful in helping us determine where possible, uh, what possible uh, food and feed uh, chain disruptions might arise. Uh, and enabling us then to develop measures to ease the situation. Uh, we've developed a, a business and industry portal, uh, and that's brought together in one place uh, the advice and guidance for food businesses. Um, we continued to signpost um, uh, government guidance uh, uh, through, um, through that mechanism as well. Um, and just in relation to Paula Wilkinson's question, um, in, in relation to a campaign, We've, we've been able to, to highlight uh, through social media the, the portal. That has received a lot of attention. Uh, so, for example, the, the page on guidance for food businesses on coronavirus has received 190,000 unique views. And the page on reopening and adapting your food business during COVID has received 45,000 unique views. And uh, our survey has indicated that 86% of visitors to the portal have found those pages useful. In terms of the easements, um, there have been a number of things. Um, first of all, and I, and I mentioned our contingency plans at the last board meeting in March, um, we, we've, we've had to think up through how we would deal with uh, not having sufficient personnel to maintain official controls in those areas that we directly uh, deal with. Um, and, and we've developed those, those plans. We, we've taken a tiered approach to uh, easing the pressures whilst ensure, ensuring safe food production and protecting animal welfare. Uh, we've also made some policy easements, uh, working closely with colleagues in FSS and the devolved administrations in DEFRA, for example, um, introducing limited flexibilities for businesses in relation to non-food safety critical labeling. Um, to help keep imports fl flowing, we've worked closely with DEFRA to reduce the pressure on import inspections. For example, um, easing some of the uh, paperwork requirements around documentation. Um, and the details of, of all of these easements are in the paper in Annex A. Um, our response has also included supporting local authorities, and that's been providing uh, operational guidance and direction on the approach that should be taken. Um, we've introduced temporary deviations from the statutory food and, f and feed law codes of practice. They, that was granted until the 17th of July. There's a further extension to those deviations proposed, and I'm going to ask, uh, Heather, if you're happy uh, to, to ask Michael Jackson to come in and outline uh, what's proposed in a moment. Yeah. Um, but just a, a couple of things uh, to conclude my, my opening comments. First of all, on staffing, um, Emily's highlighted the importance of our key workers in, in, the, in the field, and the health and well-being of our staff has been central to responding to the incident. It, the pandemic has had a significant demand upon our staff uh, and they've risen to the challenge and performed superbly. Um, in terms of the staffing numbers in, 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 in our meat plants, that has held fairly constant at around 10% absence throughout. And most of those personnel are, are shielding. Uh, unfortunately, only a very few staff have been taken ill with COVID to date. Um, the importance of social distancing has been key uh, in respect of, of meat plants, we've uh, the FSA is not the enforcement body for social distancing or face coverings, but we've provided advice to, to make sure our staff are safe and others are protected. And we've worked closely with Public Health England, with Bayes, with DEFRA, in, in assisting the development of guidance. 
Finally, then the forward plan, um, and as well as citing actions taken to date, the paper really is a roadmap for how we move from our emergency response. Um, and the last section of the paper makes reference to our forward plan, which aims to de-escalate uh, and moving the agency into what we've described as the new normal. The, the forward plan has a range of activities, some of which are for the immediate future, others for, for longer term, more strategic focus. Uh, we do recognize as well within the plan that we need to be adaptable and flexible. Um, and going forward, the, there may well be a need for local lockdowns if the virus flares up again in certain places. Um, going forward, um, we will need to adopt an approach which is either looking at restoring the easements and flexibilities that we've taken during the response phase or refer reforming and moving on. For example, uh, we're, we're currently actively looking at how we might do um, aspects of vet or audits, veterinary audits differently uh, when they recommence. It's important that we, we don't lose the lessons learned, the, the benefits and opportunities arising from this unprecedented incident. And our approach will be uh, further informed by intelligence from our work on insights and horizon scanning. Um, we'll, we'll want to model the, the impacts of changes in the food supply chain that have resulted, uh, including uh, in consumer and behavior and business behaviors that have changed. For example, the changes with uh, the increases on, in online sales and home delivery or the changes in the movement of sales from food service uh, to, to retail and whether these changes are temporary or, or more permanent. So that was all I was going to say, Heather, but uh, just in closing, if, if, if Michael can come in to cover the proposed further alterations to the, uh, the food law codes of practice. Uh, yes, Michael, it's, quite, it's important, I think, that the board have a chance to, to hear what the proposal is here. Thank you, Heather. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm sure all of the board members are aware that um, when the pandemic first arose, it was necessary for us to seek uh, a deviation from the Food Law Code of Practice um, to enable local authorities to deal with urgently active work um, and wider public health priorities and also to minimise uh, the potential for further spread um, of the disease. Um, when that direction uh, was agreed by ministers, uh, and that was necessary because the uh, Food Law Code of Practice is statutory in nature and is signed off by ministers across the three countries. Uh, we agreed that we would keep that under review. So the current um, deviation lasts until 17th of July. However, our proposal is that um, we will be uh, seeking uh, approval from ministers this week uh, to change the direction and guidance that we're offering to local authorities forthwith. Now, the, the proposed change um, will apply across the three countries um, as and when lockdown eases, so it's future-proofed and flexible. Um, and uh, in developing the, the proposals, uh, we have taken the work closely with local authority representatives and taken account of the views of our national food hygiene and food standards and information focus groups. In effect, the proposed new direction will be returning us closer to the way the world normally works. So we will be asking local authorities to move back to physical inspections. However, we will be asking them to continue to use remote assessment to inform exactly what they should look at when they undertake those site visits. Now, this is quite an important one for us, but this is something that we want to explore as part of our modernization um, program. And I'm picking up on the, the points that uh, Emily and Colin have made about not going backwards. Uh, this is something which is really the, the pace has been upped and by necessity we've seen remote assessment applying not just in local authority controls, but also more broadly with third party insurance schemes. So we want to uh, learn from uh, this particular approach and from there we can figure out how we can make remote assessment a feature of our model going forward. Not a replacement, but to contribute um, and enhance the approach. Um, looking then at the, um, the, the specifics of the proposal, this uh, deviation, um, it, deviation has a connotation that it, it's taking you in, in the wrong direction from something. Uh, what I would like to get across to the board is that this is actually giving us a much more risk-based approach to our official controls. The rigidity of the, the Food Law Code of Practice assumes 
major factors in the world don't change, uh, that the, the risk within food businesses remains constant. That's not the case. And that's the main reason why we're putting in place the, the, the deviation to enable local authorities to target where the risk really exists at this point in time. Um, getting out to those businesses that are starting to reopen after lockdowns eases, um, addressing the uh, concerns there, potentially around um, water supply, equipment functioning correctly, stock rotation, pest control, all of those things that can occur whenever a business is closed for a long period of time. Uh, the direction will not apply to any official control where that control is specified in law. So if legislation requires visits to happen at certain times uh, or samples to be taken for particular purposes, I'm um, thinking there about um, our import controls, um, approval of establishments, manufacturing products of animal origin and our shellfish, it doesn't apply there. So we will continue to apply strictly the legal requirements uh, where they're specified. Um, in developing the approach, we have banded the priorities into three groups, um, high, medium and low. Um, and the idea is that local authorities will do their best to deliver across all of those priorities um, and use their resource flexibly. Uh, one of the challenges that, that local authorities face at the moment is that because of the pandemic, uh, many officers are not able um, to go out because of shielding and personal circumstances. Um, and again, the approach that we've worked up in embedding remote assessment allows the best use of a resource that's under serious pressure uh, at this point in time. Um, I'm happy to take any questions from the board. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. Right, um, I already have two board members who'd uh, raised a hand uh, before you spoke. So I'm assuming that Mary and Tim is on a different issue. Wave at me if not. Um, and can we, first of all, just take uh, questions or input on the point that Michael has raised, in which case I think Ruth and Mark are definitely on that point, and then Colm, by the looks of it. Ruth. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, my, my points were uh, not on, on Michael's um, con Sorry, Ruth, we'll come back to you then about those points, if that's OK. Mark? Uh, I hate to say this, Helen, but my points were not specifically related to Michael's contribution either. It's just when I happened to put my hand up. <laughs> Does anybody wish to um, raise any points about the proposal from officials? It is a matter for Emily, uh, but because of the extended time and the gradual shift and the fact that we're doing this in a way which is about our our already agreed future direction. I just felt it was useful for the board to have a chance to have an input if they wished it. But Sorry, Heather, my, my, my question actually was in relation to what Michael has said, and, and it's really just to get a better understanding of what remote assessment looks like and the risk analysis process around that. So, I mean, it, it's really just to, to get a little bit more clarity, Michael, as to what you mean and, and how remote assessment and how ready are uh, local authorities, because obviously we, we are reopening in all three countries at different paces at different times and so forth uh, and still some debate certainly in Northern Ireland about the move from two to one meet and all those sorts of things so how, how ready are local authorities and tell me how remote assessment differs from what we do today. Okay Colin I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards in, in terms of readiness um, the, the reason why we have been pushing ahead with our review of the direction is because of the, the, the unknowns around when uh, the hospitality industry will become unlocked in each of the countries. Um, subject to ministers agreeing uh, to, to the proposals, we will communicate this to local authorities as quickly as possible. Um, the direction is also accompanied by um, a Q&A, which uh, we've been updating um, over the course of, of COVID-19. And again, that would be issued to local authorities on Monday of next week. And that will give them as much heads up as possible to enable them to prepare to move forward uh, with a new approach. In terms then of um, the, the issue of remote assessment, um, basically what we're talking about there Colm, is ways of looking at evidence that you can do other than be, being in the premises. So for example, um, 
food business operators can make records available. Um, some of those currently already hold those digitally. It, it can be easy enough to, to share those with local authorities. Um, we encourage telephone conversations. And what we're seeing increasingly is a use of video. So local authorities actually uh, not relying on things like photographs where one might have concerns about the integrity, but actually having live video calls within a business um, and being asked to be directed to see certain areas and so on. Uh, so it involves a range of things. Um, I say it prevents, presents a great opportunity for us to explore how we might embed this in the system um, as a permanent feature. Local authorities are responding well. Um, one of the challenges that we've had uh, for the last few years is that um, the ability of, of individual local authorities to work in a digital way um, and work remotely um, has varied quite, quite a lot. Um, like ourselves uh, and every other part of, of government, they've had to adapt um, and they're really much better positioned now to be able to use technology. And we're even seeing the marketplace starting to respond by providing solutions that would assist uh, local authorities with remote assessments should that become a permanent feature. That's okay, you're nodding calm. I think that's okay. Excellent. I think we're, we're done on that particular point then. So thank you very much for bringing that just so that we're all cited on it. Got a, heaps of people wanting to talk. No, Emily wants to say something about it. Sorry, I did just want to come in on, on the local authority point just to make the strategic point for the board to register, which is that local authority resource on environmental health and trading standards is under pressure because of COVID-19, um, not least because uh, getting the economy working again is going to fall heavily on local authority um, uh, people. So we are very alive to that. We, we, we don't want food and food safety to get forgotten in the conversation. Um, so the work Michael's been doing with local authorities has been really important. But also we're trying to make sure we join up with um, other parts of government who have requirements on those, um, on those professionals. So, for example, I met the Office of Product Safety Standards on Monday um, because we they also put pressure on, tra uh, put demands on trading standards. Uh, we used to join up with Health and Safety Executive and so on. And actually, I think the role of local authorities over the next six to 12 months is going to be so key um, to the recovery. We, we need to pay this constant attention and it will feature in our SR conversations as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, before we go to any other input from board members. I did want us to have the chance also to, to hear from Guy about the role that he's been playing within and outside the FSA during this crisis. But first of all, I'm gonna ask Rick if he might just say something about this issue about transitioning food because our audience might have seen some press reports over the last 24 hours uh, suggesting that there's some uh, view from China about the risk of contamination in relation to fish. And I just thought it was an opportunity for us to put, put on the record again what our risk assessment is. Rick, can I hand over to you on that? Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, so to be very clear, as was mentioned earlier, we have done a, a full and comprehensive risk assessment looking at the, the risk of the virus that causes COVID-19 and the possibility of transmission through the food supply chain on food packaging. And, and in... in, in um, to be, to be open and transparent, we've published that and that's fully av it's available on our website and um, we, we've shared that with, with other government partners and, in, and indeed internationally. Um, we appreciate this is a new disease, there's new things coming out about it all the time, so we continue to review and look at evidence. But at this point in time, we have no evidence to suggest there is a significant risk associated with food. We've got no evidence that any fish or a shellfish or livestock um, get infected with the virus. Um, we, we see no evidence um, uh, out there that there's any transmission um, that, that's been published on, on, on transmission in the food supply chain. So we think the risk is, is as, as the risk assessment says, very low. Um, in terms of this, this current situation, we are working with other government departments, we are working with others um, across the four nations to, to look at this and, and put together a collective response. And indeed, the evidence base from our risk assessment will be at the heart of that. Thank you very much for that, Rick. I, I'm not proposing we need to discuss that, but I just thought it was a chance for us to put it on the record since that is a running story at the minute. And then I just thought if Guy could share with us what he's been doing, and then we'll have more questions. Yes. Oh, thank you, um, Heather. Yeah, I, I think um, you know what, what we are kind of discussing here is the fact of how to be proportionate 
in terms of how one addresses this risk. And, and, and in some ways, you see this in, in all aspects to do with COVID. I mean, those uh, watching um, the, you know, the, the advice from people like Chris Whitty will have seen the whole time talking about trying to weigh up the various things that you do in relation to the health issues associated with COVID and then the other health issues associated with measures you put in place to try and address COVID. And in some, in, in similar ways, we're in the same space here. So one of the things I've spent time with is when Colin and other members of the team have been discussing about how might one have to adapt some of the things we do. Uh, it, it is to try to kind of work out at what point it would be not proportionate to offer that relaxation at that moment in time and other times in which it is the proportionate thing to do because of the other issues and the other, some of which are health and other, others are just other consumer interests, which could be affected by trying to actually stay conducting things exactly as they were coming into COVID. And, and following that a little bit further, that's where working with some of the other chief scientific advisors and some of the other government departments that have been mentioned, whether that be health and safety executive or Bayes, has been enabled us to stay in that circle of discussion about what we can do and what might be done which can affect us to make sure that we're all joined up in our thinking. A very specific example is, as Rick described, uh, we've done a lot of work in relation to the risk assessment of food and the packaging surrounding food. And, and now one of the members of our team is actually on the working group of SAGE, which is actually feeding in all the information about what is the environmental dynamics, whether that, as I say, in terms of packaging or food as a surface, um, which the government needs to think about in terms of how it manages the risks of COVID. So, so, I, so I suppose my kind of role has been acting as a challenge within the FSA and helping facilitate the important networks outside. But I think the key thing here is it's a complex system and, and we are being proportionate in terms of being agile and responsive as the situations arise. Thank you ever so much, Guy. That's really helpful. So, um, order in which your hands were raised, I'm going to Mark and then Margaret. Thank you. I'm not sure we get a reputation for being the first person to put their hand up at this rate. Um, I just have a, a couple of things, if, if I may, uh, from the report, uh, really. One of the lines in the report suggests that uh, there's been no significant safety issues uh, during this period, as evidenced by our surveillance. Uh, and I wonder if we could just have a bit more information about that surveillance in terms of we know that local authorities haven't been doing the boots on the ground kind of surveillance. So presumably we're, we're relying on all of the other bits and just a little bit of reassurance around uh, exactly what that is and what, and what that's shown us would, would be of value if, if possible. Um, there's another comment in the report around food legislation flexibilities. Uh, and one of the things it says there is uh, talking about uh, allowing certain less important practices to be suspended. And I just wonder if that process of, of looking at that legislation actually includes the question about whether those less important practices add any value at all. Uh, so rather than just suspending them, whether they're actually adding value or could do with a wider uh, review. And I know that's not a, a small ask in terms of legislation. Uh, my next point is around, there's a comment in the report around uh, deferring planned work um, and we know that, uh, or I know certainly that deferring some of the food standards work has had a knock-on effect with uh, the official control laboratories, and I know there's a big piece of work going on to, to redress that, uh, but I just wondered if there are any other unintended consequences to doing the right thing in these circumstances that we need to be alive to. Um, and just in relation to, to the, the, uh, the stuff that Michael covered for us, um, I did have a comment in relation to that, not a question, but just... Uh, really to welcome the fact that we're looking at uh, the the lessons that can be learned from the situation that we're in and trying to introduce those into our future practice. I think one of the frustrations with the statutory code of practice is that it's perhaps not as fleet of foot as some other means. Uh, so if there's an opportunity now to learn some of those lessons and start to introduce those, I think that can be uh, only a good thing. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I need to gather up a few questions because... Um I'm not being very speedy in managing this meeting. Uh, Margaret. Um, thanks, Heather. And um, I'd like to add my voice to everyone saying that uh, the uh, staff have done, as the paper says, a superb job. 
Um, looking forward um, and with the hindsight of COVID, and this is looking very much forward, um, I've in the past done quite a bit on the National Risk Register, and I wondered how much we factored in that National Risk Register into our own strategic um, analysis, um, especially as pandemic has been up there at the top right since the first time it was published years ago. Um, the second one is, um, given the other potential high level risks on that register, how robust are our plans if in a different scenario, a global crisis had totally disrupted the food supply chain or involved widespread contamination? Are these things um, that we look at regularly or is it something we need to, once this is over, really go back into? And I'm thinking about the tanker driver's strike um, in the late 90s, which brought the whole supply chain to a standstill in a week. Um, and then one other question, totally unrelated, um, uh, but just um, on the COVID thing, I'd also identify the question raised at the very beginning of this meeting by a member of the, of the public. Um, this issue of lots of people who've started uh, selling food and may not realise um, that they do need to, um, it's their responsibility really to sign up. Um, uh, how do we help the local authorities who are so overburdened at the moment? Um, one way may be that right now the local authorities, I think, are all um, sending out weekly newsletters to residents and it may be we could draft something and remind people that they do have to register there. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Ruth. Thank you. Um, well, again, to echo um, fantastic response from uh, everyone at the FSA. Um, I should preface my comments with a declaration of interest in that in the early phase of uh, this uh, situation, I did have a role with the uh, government department MHCLG, uh, which is no longer um, uh, um, happening, but uh, just to put that on the record. Um, I was interested uh, in thoughts about uh, the next phase going forward and um, that we obviously have to live with the risk of a second wave, um, restarting hospitality and I really welcome the focus on the, uh, the sustainability of local government and the pressure that they will be facing to uh, deal with all these issues but also the importance of, of us as an agency being ready for a potential uh, second wave and embedding some of the lessons learned. Um, I really welcome the, the reflective um, emphasis in the paper. Um, it's uh, really important that we find the time to reflect as things are evolving. And I was particularly interested in the reflection on developing uh, cross-government advice. Obviously, in the food system, there are multiple interested parties. And what you think um, you'd want to embed now going forward in terms of the ability to produce um, advice and guidance rapidly uh, it, um, for future situations that we might face. And the only uh, other point I wanted to make was um, certainly in Wales, when the Welsh Food Advisory Committee uh, looked at the response, which they were very appreciative of, um, they also wondered, uh, in light of the switch to online ordering, whether we should expedite the work on uh, mandating um, uh, display of uh, food hygiene rating uh, scores on uh, online uh, suppliers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hold uh, Timothy and Stuart um, until we've had responses on that bundle of input. Um, Emily, do you want to start? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, really good set of questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, actually starting with Margaret, um, the National Risk Register, I think this is a really important point. We are um, we are very, very plugged in to the Civil Contingency Secretariat and the National Risk Register. And our corporate risk register um, is, is written in the light of uh, the National Risk Register. So we do follow it very closely. Um, we also take part in the exercises if there is a food aspect um, that the Civil Contingency Secretariat run, which are, and they organise the exercises based on the risks on the, that risk register. So we are, we are very plugged in. Um, I would say that I think the um, the experience of this uh, has it's already taught us something different about how to run an incident in the agency because we are all of our plans were based on um, a food safety incident, not an incident that affected 
everything else in the country at the same time as something that could have implications for food safety or other aspects of food availability. So um, quite rapidly at the beginning um, in, in March, we needed to adjust our own processes to reflect us nesting inside the broader, um, the broader piece. So I think we're, we're already learning and doing that better. But I do think um, there are potential crises to come. So, for example, if there were to be a climate crisis, where, which Henry Dibbleby describes the possibility of two failures of harvest across the world, you had that for two years in a row you would have a significant food supply issue and that is something that we need to um we need to start considering i've asked steve wern um to help us on um creating some corporate scenarios so the the received discipline in terms of preparing for uncertainty is that it's good to work with scenarios because you can't see what's coming but if you can put your virtual reality headset on and imagine what life is going to be like in uh, a reason a, a reasonable worst case um so whether that's um the, the climate crisis one i describe or in fact there might be political scenarios um for example if there's more um tension between the four nations and we need to be ready to do that so in the autumn the executive management team will be um take, taking ourselves through a process of making sure we have those scenarios um so that we can uh, deepen our thinking about um, uncertainty and risk um on uh the uh, I wanted to thank Ruth for her comments on the reflection, the, the reflective emphasis of the report. It's incredibly important to me and to the executive team that we um, are reflective as we go. It, again, when you're in an unfolding, uncertain, volatile situation, the only thing you can do is keep observing and reflecting and changing what you do. We've already collected about 300 lessons learned from people across the agency and people outside the agency about what we've done. And we're, tr we're looking to embed those in our governance, um, in the way we relate to each other, in our communications with business, in our stakeholder engagement and so on. And um, on the labelling, sorry, on the four countries point, so what the cross government and what would I want to be in place? Um, I, I do think there is a bit of a gap at the moment about our ability to look at some quite detailed um, technical food law issues in a joined up way um, with sufficient strategic governance. And labelling is the example for me, which, you know, the parts of policy that relate to a food label sit in several different government departments in Whitehall. And then also it's a devolved matter for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and when we went into the question of labelling easement, we had to um, quickly uh, work out exactly the scope of the, the um, remit for the FSA, um, what role ministers played, um, and make sure that we were working as one. And I think we basically need to be flexing that muscle much more frequently uh, as we move forward. Um, I, I'm in conversation with DEFRA about how we improve that. Um, but I, I think we're going to need... Uh, I think there's very good relationships at official level, at quite junior official level, but we're going to need better strategic official um, engagement and then also potentially more ministerial engagement. And the task force that Heather has been sitting on in terms of food supply to the vulnerable, I think has been a really good example where devolved nations and the Westminster government are coming together to try and solve a problem collectively. And I hope that will be um, the sort of thing that could be mirrored going forward. I'll pause there and perhaps hand over to Colin to pick up a lot of Mark's comments. Yes, uh, thanks, Emily. So um, just to, to add to the issue about exercises, um, we do run exercises. We are alive to the possibility of several incidents running in parallel, which would involve um, separate incident teams, briefing sales and so on. So that's something that uh, we will continue to do going forward. Uh, it was something we were we were alive to whenever we were in the, the space of, of EU exit and um, it's something we're alive to going forward. Um, Mark raised the question around surveillance and how we do that if there are some constraints. Um, we've, we have continued to, to um, derive intel from a range of different sources, whether that be our, our horizon scanning work uh, and there's a, a quantitative and qualitative data and an expert panel. There's our stakeholder engagement team and incidents uh, that doing the receipt and management work, um, uh, similar to RASIV. Uh, there's the National Food Crime Unit. Um, there's the local authority hub uh, that RCD run. There's intel from other government departments where we share, share SITREP reports. So we have, we, we, I think, have built up quite a good picture in terms of uh, where the, uh, the weaknesses are in terms of um, different stages uh, along the food supply chain. 
and it's something we 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 uh, try to update on a on a regular basis and a weekly basis for the the sit rep. It's something that we could do, I think, better, and it's something that uh, we will will seek to improve. Um, in terms of actions uh, that we've taken, whether they um, are um, something that will go forward into uh, maintain or, or not, and whether there are unintended consequences uh, from any of the actions or easements that we've taken. Um, admittedly, some of these easements have had to be uh, undertaken quite quickly. But as we go through in the forward plan and decisions have to then be made as to whether we restore the, the, uh, the previous position or whether we retain what we have brought in place, uh, we will have to obviously think of the consequences longer term. So that's something that uh, the forward plan uh, needs needs to be alive to. Um, Mark also mentioned the impact and uh, and and on um, uh, and Ma Margaret uh, on uh, local authorities. And um, we've been working with MH CLG uh, in terms of the overall impact on local authorities of and uh, on, on the live to that. Thanks, Colin. I think Julie might want to come in, but I just wanted to also. I think. Mark raised a really good point about his uh, review of food legislation from what we've learned, going to include just we don't need to reinstate some things. What were they there for? And I think I think I know the board well enough to say we are all in that place of rules that are there because they've always been there or because they were driven by our being part of a bigger, more complex uh, rulemaking system in the EU. We definitely need to have the courage to say that they are adding nothing to public protection if we conclude that that's the right answer and there are better or other ways of achieving the same or a better outcome in terms of the, the public interest. And I think, I think that's absolutely embedded in the way that we've approached reform generally. And I also want to just say to Margaret, um, about, I think it's about 12 months ago now, um, many of the exec members uh, here and comms colleagues and I uh, attended refresher COBRA training. So there's a, a level of preparedness that keeps going on there. And Philip is superb at keeping us on point about the things we need to know and be ready for and understand. Julie. Thank you. Um, again, just on one of Mark's questions about unintended consequences. We're also live to positive unintended consequences. Um, and are looking, for example, of whether there's a, a reduction in foodborne disease because of an increase in hand washing um, for, for a different purpose, but, but whether we can see that. Also looking at changing consumer behaviour, like increased in home and scratch cooking, um, whether that, again, is having a reduction possibly in um, disease, disease outbreaks. And also, um, I think consumers' relationship with food, how they buy food, what, what they buy, um, advertising, whether or not that may be, um, again, having a positive impact on what people buy. Maybe they're buying more healthily. Um, so um, those are the sorts of things we're looking for. I'm not saying that um, we can see evidence for them at the moment, but we are actively looking um, for that sort of information as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got three more board members and then we'll conclude this item. I've got Timothy, then Stuart, then Mary. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, my signal keeps dropping out. It's part of living in sort of rural areas. So <laughs> uh, please bear with me. Um, first of all, just I think it bears repetition to add the voice to thanking staff for what they've achieved. I think it's been uh, amazing keeping key staff safe continue to protect consumer and ensuring minimal business disruption uh, through our regulatory roles. Two specific questions. Um, the first is, and I think we've touched on this somewhat in the surveillance and easements, but um, just to understand whether there are plans to keep records of each case where labeling, for example, may diverge from practice due to COVID contingencies and to ensure that there are either remain temporary practices or labelling is corrected thereafter. So it's just around crossing uh, the T's and dotting the I's. And my other question is uh, specifically around meat processing facilities, where there are moves I understand to implement track and trace, certainly for uh, contingency planning and ensuring continuity of staff. Uh, while this is a positive step, uh, is there a possibility this could increase increase the number of self-isolations and have we factored that into our risk assessment? Thank you very much. 
Stuart. Thank you, Chair. It sort of follows on from Tim's point. Um, it, it's a great document, but I, I just wonder, do we do we give enough consideration to risk appetite? Uh, I mean, I know it's it's the sort of shifting um, shifting picture and, and lexicon of of risk work, but you know, if we, I'm not sure I understand what the risk appetite of government is, but do we know sufficiently our own risk appetite as an employer, as a regulator, what the risk appetite is of those who we regulate? As we've seen, um, if just looking at the general population, I'm not sure we understand the risk appetite of the consumer ultimately, if we look at recent behaviours for whatever reason. And are we building this into how we are doing our job? Thanks. And Mary? Thanks. Um, so just wanting to, uh, there's a mention in the papers about, uh, you know, possible yes. horse meat. Uh, are there additional um, threats ar arising from food crime and how would that arise that's, that, uh, going forward and how would we know that? Um, really, a uh, second point is that uh, I've been very grateful to the guidelines. I think many people in the food industry have been very, very grateful for the really effective, proactive way in which we've come up with guidelines for the food industry uh, and, uh, and the way that that has been amplified by trade associations. You know, I've had the papers from several different directions. When we're looking, as so very grateful and thank you, when we're looking at the food, uh, you know, increase in food, uh, people wanting to set up food businesses from their homes or uh, people doing more work, but doing more food preparation at home. Is there any way that we can look to amplify that with, um, uh, you know, through it, novel routes? I mean, I was thinking sort of Mum's Net or any of those other places. Um, I think the trade associations amplify because they pick it up, but I'm wondering whether we need to be proactive in that. And then a third sort of general point is, you know, we it's been absolute, as people have said, absolutely magnificent on the way that uh, the FSA have dealt with this endurance test. How, what is our preparedness for a continuation of this endurance test? And then another potential shock to the food system coming in with uh, Brexit preparations. Thank, Thank you. you. Can we just deal with Mary's mention of horse meat first? Because we have a, quite a lot of journalists diving into this call and I don't want them to think they've already written their headline. Colin. Yeah, well, in terms of Intel for NFCU, um, Intel comes into NFCU from a range of different sources. They are very alive to the issues. Uh, they're fully engaged uh, in uh, discussions. And obviously, we are, we are, we are working with uh, the, the, the bodies I mentioned earlier when I was dealing with surveillance. Um, so we are alive to these issues. Um, we have had we have had same, some issues of food crime in terms of um, um, sheep stealing and so on in the north of England, which we've been very alive to, and NFCU have been involved in. So um, absolutely, we, 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 we respond to the intel, absolutely. Thank you. Um on the other points, uh, can I start? Maybe. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll go through each in turn. So, Tim, uh, do we keep records of each case for the temporary easements? Yes, we do. There are around 20 or so that have already happened. They're all temporary. I think we've only got one left in place. Um, and we're expecting to reverse the easement very shortly. Um, meat processing facilities, track and trace. Um, and are we factoring in self-isolation into our community planning? We are. The only thing is that um, with the track and trace approach, the intention obviously is to make it a localised restriction rather than a national restriction. So, it, uh, And we have got staff who can't necessarily travel that far to a different plant. Um, so we're having to, to do that in quite a complex way. But Colin can say more about that potentially. Stuart's question about risk appetite um, and whether we've got the right risk appetite and whether, whether we understand the risk appetite of the consumer. So we, um, at the moment, we are operating within the risk appetite set by the board. And I was just trying to find the description of that. So, for example, on food we can trust, um, you've, you've asked us to be averse to material risks that have potentially significant impact on public health, but uh, cautious where benefits outweigh the risk open to considered innovation where the best interest for consumers are demonstrated and hungry for effective partnerships 
on improving nutrition of food and consumer eating patterns. So that's that's the thing you've asked us to do already. Um, and we've on operational, um, you've asked us to be hungry to consider innovation where improvement can protect and deliver consumer benefits, hungry to ensure colleagues are developed, supported and well-led, and averse where safety of our colleagues is potentially compromised. So you've already given us those, those directions. And actually, they have. I think they've held up very well through this crisis. Um, and the one time when we thought we were skirting to the edge of that risk appetite was when we um, encountered uh, a legal risk around the labelling easement and we came to you just to check um, on that. Can I, just, uh, can I just interrupt you there, Emily, as well, because I just want to give the board some additional uh, reassurance that Emily and I have a weekly meeting and the constant component of that is to test whether in any areas that are going in the crosses with the executive responsibilities, there are things that, that might touch on the board's risk appetite or the position the board take. And I think we, we've shown that we have got a mechanism where we can quickly escalate those and seek guidance, even if it's not a board decision. And um, I just thought I'd add that in as an extra level of comfort for the board. The, the question about the consumer risk appetite, I think that the thing that's become obvious in the last three months is that depends on the context. So you, one is prepared to take more risk um, if uh, the context allows and one takes less risk if the context is affected. So that's why our um, real-time consumer surveillance is so important. And the work that Julie and Michelle Patel and others have been doing to build up that capability over the last few weeks is making a significant difference to our ability to get a sense of where the consumer risk appetite lies. So, um, and that, just to, to say a little bit more about that, it consists of um, uh, uh, very rapid um, consumer polling, which can be turned around in a week or two, um, a, fo a focus group work that we can um, roll out very quickly again with, with a week or two's notice, and then a panel of about 90 experts from industry, academia, and elsewhere where Michelle and others are going out with a survey on a weekly or fortnightly basis to say, what are you seeing? What are you noticing? Um, and that has led us um, to a number of things, and we'll publish this research very shortly. But for example, um, the food security issues that uh, people between the ages of 16 and 24 are facing has gone up um, in terms of our awareness uh, and um, the, the uh, uh, access to uh, worries about whether the ability to pay for food um, is clearly higher than it was, say, a year ago. So that is enabling us to focus on where, the, where our um, activity should be. Um, on Mary's question about Brexit preparations, I mean, we obviously we've already left the EU, but the transition period ends at the end of this year. Um, the government has been absolutely crystal clear that that transition period date is not end, is not shifting, and our um, plans therefore completely conform to that. Um, the, the issues that uh, the government ran into last time on uh, preparedness for a No Deal Brexit were a lot about third party dependencies. So were businesses ready? Did they knew what they, they needed to do um, in terms of getting access to export health certificates or fish cap certificates or whatever? And then secondly, were other partners ready? So local authorities and others um, ready uh, for changes in the way that the economy was going to work? Um, and those issues will remain true for us. We, we um, are, have got a smaller role than, for example, DEFRA or some other government departments. But where we are, for example, um, assisting, we assist a little bit with export health certificates. We think a lot about import controls and our port health authority partners will need to be ready. It means we need to engage early. Um, I've just come uh, from a meeting where um, industry was saying, actually, could we get the engagement and preparedness done um, by November, having a the transition period ending at the end of December, given that retail is so exposed over Christmas and so busy, we have to do it early. So that is going to uh, be how, how we try and approach uh, managing um, the risk and making sure we're as ready as possible. I'm also conscious we didn't reply to, I didn't reply to two previous questions. So Ruth on mandating display of FHRS, um, of the food hygiene rating system, um, where in, in, in Wales and Northern Ireland at the moment, it, it's... It, restaurants and others have to display their sticker and in England they don't. Um, the FSA has said for some months that we think that should be mandatory. We're in quite a live conversation with the Department of Health about that, not least because we think that um, the FHR arrest rating, although it doesn't comment directly on a COVID secure establishment, it does comment actually on the quality of management of that establishment and how good they are at managing risk. So we think it might help give consumers a bit more confidence if the food hygiene rating is high. Um, so we think the mandatory display would help. Um, and on the um, 
uh, communications and registering a food business, uh, needing to make sure that businesses are aware of that and the question that was raised at the start. And we are obviously doing lots of communications around that, but we will take that away and see if we need to do any more. Thank you. Thank you very much to the whole team for that. That has been a really thorough review of where we are, what we've done and, and what we might be doing next. And I think uh, to echo the board's views, very useful to have that level of reflection and preparedness about my, what might be coming next. Um, we don't yet know whether we might be called to give evidence to the EFRA Select Committee as they start to uh, investigate the pandemic and its impact in the sector that we care for, uh, but we will uh, keep everybody posted on that. We are now going to turn to um, our discussion about uh, the EU transition um, and I'm going to hand over to Paul Morrison to take us through that. Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And, and Emily was, was touching on some of the, uh, the points uh, in, in her final answers there. So the, the board has a, has a paper in uh, front of it. Just to you know, reiterate what Emily said, it's, it's not just that the government has now indicated that there, there will be no extension uh, to, the, uh, to the transition period. Uh, in a meeting this week, the Prime Minister had with the presidents of the EU Commission Council and Parliament, that is now the position. We've, we've reached the point of uh, no return on that, and that's agreed that we will now be reaching the, the end of transition at the end of the year. Um, the paper that, the, the, that uh, we published uh, reminds us of the, of the principles that we've been pursuing in uh, preparations for that uh, approach, um, uh, in particular that you know, we, we, we don't want to do anything uh, that uh, Make, renders less effective our ability to protect health and maintain consumer confidence, disrupt uh, consumers or industry, but also uh, to continue to, to seek uh, as unified a system as possible uh, in the consumer interest. And we can we can come on to that as we we go into some of the areas that, that have emerged as our, as our, the picture has become clearer on on how uh, things are progressing. So. First thing to say is having uh, having reached uh, that very clear position on the end of transition, we're now moving into a period of intensification of the negotiations uh, around the free trade agreement with the Commission and also uh, kicked off the, um, the negotiations with the, the US on, on an FTA, a free trade agreement there. Emily is actually going to, to come in uh, after I've finished talking with a, with a few more details around that and, and some of the debates that have been, been having had. Um, uh, the paper sets out uh, in, in a more detail uh, than uh, we had previously had in our discussions because we've we've had the command paper which has set out in more detail uh, the arrangements around the Northern Ireland Protocol and uh, what we are looking to head towards there. Um, but also, uh, in addition, since the paper was published, uh, and I'll, I'll just quickly update the board, we've also had some further clarification or, around uh, the import controls after the end of the transition period. Um, and as, as uh, board members would have seen, it was announced last week on the 12th of June that the introduction of the import controls will be phased. Um, and that will be over three horizons, uh, a, uh, a minimal position uh, in, in January of particular interest to us and the direction that we've received from the board. DEFRA have confirmed that uh, from the end of March, beginning of April, we will uh, have pre-notification uh, of products of animal origin from the EU via IPATHs. So that's uh, on, our, on our kind of critical path through this. And at that point, documentary checks will be undertaken. And then the final stage of the phasing will be in July 2021, uh, when full safety and security declarations will be required, uh, increased physical checks for the takings of uh, samples around SPS uh, commodities, uh, and uh, checks at the, the border control post. So uh, as the paper says, that's uh, you know, leading to what we need to do around the infrastructure that's required, working very closely with uh, DEFRA. Uh, and working through that principle on the introduction of import controls. But also we are working now through the detail of, the, of what it means in practice around the application of the Northern Ireland Protocol with the, you know, the, the other government, government departments in you, uh, other governments in the UK as well as other government departments uh, across Whitehall. Um, and we can, we can pick up there, but the, the paper is basically uh, underlining that in approaching it, while the arrangements will inevitably uh, create some uh, some issues we have to work through around the fact that different regulatory uh, systems will be operating in Northern Ireland and uh, within the rest of the United Kingdom in, in Great Britain. Um, 
we, we now have a, a, a clear framework around that to, to work through the issues which are identified here. So interested to hear uh, the board's uh, questions around that um, and uh, able to update. But at this point, we are seeking just to reassure the board that those areas that are within our accountability and responsibility we are progressing with. We will still continue through those uh, processes and engagement that I've described, continue to apply the principles that the board have set us uh, around the analysis of risk and uh, uh, how we are weighing consumer interests in the way that we uh, deliver and manifest the protocol. Um, and finally, that we have really, you know, we have a, understood and incorporated the impact of our previous discussion on COVID and really honed and focused the attention that we're making, particularly on those areas around the import controls and the Northern Ireland protocol uh, in the transformation uh, or the activity that we're pursuing. Um, Emily, I know you wanted to come in and talk a little more uh, around some of the context for the uh, trade negotiations. Yeah, I, thanks, Paul. I, I just wanted to comment on um, uh, the National Farmers Union proposal for a Food and Farming Standards Commission. Um, and obviously, this has been in the ether at least since January. Um, I, I was just looking back through the board minutes and I flagged at the March board that I felt that even those close to EU exit and the trade debate didn't always fully appreciate the Food Standards Agency's role on food standards and particularly the role we'll be taking on from December, from January next year. And then um, in, back in January, you put on record um, your, uh, your, your um, desire to make sure there weren't conflicting roles between bodies and to make sure that the Food Standards Agency's um, role was properly respected and understood. Just to explain, um, for those of the, I think the board knows this well, but perhaps for those who are, who are watching may not understand it as well. Um, we do, the FSA has a duty to provide advice to public bodies and others on the broader consumer interests in food, and that's in our statute. So whilst I think some have assumed that the Food Standards Agency is a food safety agency, um, that is not actually correct. And in the 1999 Food Standards Act, we were set up um, to look at food safety and public health issues and, quote, other consumer interests in food. Um, from... January, we take on the responsibility from the um, European Food Safety Authority and from the Commission questions about um, what we, we've called our risk analysis process. So it's the responsibility to give risk judgments on all sorts of different aspects of food. That includes um, highly regulated products like novel foods, but it also could be on a generic question if um, a government department wanted to ask us, for example, about um, the consumer interests or food safety issues to do with the trade deal, they could commission us to do that. Um, and we've set out, and in fact, Guy Poppy has um, published today, um, how we're going to do the science and evidence piece of that risk analysis process. But just to be really clear, um, we will consider the food safety aspects and um, the science and evidence behind that. But we also will, as we are, as is appropriate and, can, and we've taken this lead from Codex Alimentarius, the international standard setting body, we will look at, quote, other legitimate factors in food. And that includes factors like um, uh, wider consumer interests, consumer habits, acceptability, preferences. So that's where, for example, um, preferences and views on animal welfare or environmental protection could feature economic impacts. Um, so that could be about pricing or it could be about particular sections of industry and technical and feasibility considerations. So as we prepare our dossier of evidence on a particular food um, issue, which might, for example, be an application for an authorisation of a new chemical wash, we will look at both the food safety aspects and the other con uh, consumer interests, the other legitimate factors. We will gather that evidence together um, and come to a recommendation to ministers on whether something should be authorised or not. And we will make that public because we think the transparency of this process is essential for trust. And if people don't trust the regulator on food, then um, food isn't food you can trust. So that, that is incredibly important to us. We've also increased our resources to do this. So we've expanded our science team. It's now got about 100 scientists in. Um, our risk assessment function has doubled in size to 50 people. And we've also expanded our scientific advisors on our um, scientific advisory committees and joint expert groups um, so that we can draw on the best expertise from across the country in that process. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was all on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And just to reinforce, um, the board know that because we've spent since, I was just looking back at the papers, 
since September 2018, debating in public and agreeing what these mechanisms, tests, processes and factors will be. Uh, so really important that everybody understands uh, that that has been part of an open and shared debate. Right, uh, input on uh, this, please. I, I got Dave first. Morning, thank you. Um, as you say, Heather, we've been um, very clear on our position over um, how we're going to manage the transition out of the European Union um, and indeed how we're going to conduct ourselves and input to the trade negotiations. Um, and we talk about those principles um, here. And one of the things we were asked at the end of this report is whether we feel those principles um, still apply or are being um, compromised in any, any way. Um, clearly, the, the, there appears, at least to me, some uh, compromise caused by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, it's there. Um, it's not going away. Um, and we're going to have to consider how we manage that um, because it will potentially allow for some consumer confusion um, and as really outlined in 4.3 um, can also create a loophole for EU regulated foods to get into the UK when the UK um, has chosen in the future um, not to allow them. So I guess I'm just interested in how we intend to manage that communications message um, and also how we intend to ensure that um, our team and our partners in Northern Ireland have the necessary capacity and capability to deal with the complexity that the protocol is going to bring. Dave, absolutely on the money with that question, as ever. Um, I, I just want to come back on the, the front part of it and then uh, let uh, Emily and uh, Maria and other colleagues uh, come in and I'm sure Colm might have a view. It seems to me that the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a material change since we did our no deal planning, uh, material change and has many implications for us, is an additional factor that we will need to take into account. But it shouldn't be the determining factor in how we form our judgments about the safety and acceptability of food uh, in, in this country. So we serve three populations, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and it seems to me that we should continue to apply the tests and the approach that have been developed by this board over this whole period of EU exit planning. That should be what we do to reach our view on what we think the right risk management ought to be. And then in Northern Ireland, we will need to adjust that very openly and deliberately and clearly for the provisions of the Northern Ireland Protocol. We, we might sometimes need to do it in England and Wales as well. We, we kind of don't quite know yet. But I think it, for, for me, it seems really important that we form our slightly more pure view to start with, and then adjust it for the political realities of the protocols so that there's a clear audit trail to the point that you've made about why a different solution might be being put in place for consumers in Northern Ireland. Um, and also the ability for us to try to influence into the EU's own standard setting processes, uh, because we will want to ensure that the interests of consumers in Northern Ireland are understood in terms of its implications for them. But that's, as I've, and I think this is so complex and so difficult to get your head around, but for me, that is the way that we can hold together and in the interests of the consumer as unified as possible view, driven by science and evidence on the safety and other consumer interests, and then overlay the protocol when we've got to that view. So I think we're gonna to have to work this through and try it out quite a lot, but I can't see us having another starting point at this stage without losing the coherence of the argument that we've had so far. Emily or Maria, you want to come in on that? I'll start and then um, Maria can, can carry on. So um, this question about whether EU regulated goods that, have, that haven't been authorised in um, by us, in, uh, by the FSA and in the UK, whether they can sort of come through the back door through Northern Ireland, I think that risk is very low at the start. We will be completely harmonised um, on uh, the 1st of January. And then there may be divergence over time. A lot will depend on the trade deal that gets done um, as to what kind of level of equivalence or harmonisation gets reached to. So this is all a theoretical risk at the moment. Uh, but though I was asking the team what would be the example of a product like this. Um, and, and this goes to Heather's point about um, consumer assessment. So the, the issue, for example, of an additive that might be an orange squash, 
Now, the, the UK has a different consumption pattern of orange squash than other parts of the EU because we have children that tend to drink it, whereas in other parts of the EU often, so I'm told, it's, it's a sports drink, which adults drink. Um, so the additive that might be put into an adult drink, you might do a different risk assessment for the consumer there as opposed to one um, where a child is drinking it. So it's incredibly important that we continue to bring that UK perspective of the consumer into these risk assessments. And we must think about the Northern, we must pay attention to the Northern Irish consumption patterns um, and the Northern Irish experience, because that is our responsibility. So we must continue to think in this three country way. If um, it, it, in that situation, we may want to try and reflect those if we have formal contact with the EU as they come to a decision on a particular additive. Um, but we will also be really clear about what we're doing in, in GB. Um, I think the, the communications will be challenging. It's, it, uh, and so we're going to have to be as simple and clear as possible with consumers about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, in terms of capability and capacity, so Maria has been expanding her team and Paul Morrison, um, our strategy um, legal and governance director, has also we've just been looking at whether we can put more resource into our policy functions and our strategy function as well because this is complicated and we are going to need more resource on it over the next period. Thanks Emily. Colm. Chair thank you and, and, and thanks for, for those comments I, and by the way I completely agree Chair with your uh, view that we do need to keep the, the, uh, the process we agreed back as, as far as 2018 and we've worked our way through on a three country basis and manage the differences that, that, that exist within that. I suppose my question is around cross government working both from uh, across uh, devolved nations and across Whitehall because the, the paper very clearly states that those things that are within the gift of the FSA are broadly on track uh, and, and we need to understand where we're working. Emily's earlier point uh, that given the Christmas retail period, uh, we need to get ready almost a little bit early for this. Uh, I'm just a little bit concerned in the shortness of time uh, and, and what we're doing. And, and you, you know from our discussions with the uh, the Environment Minister in Northern Ireland last week uh, and his team, uh, we do need to move as quickly as possible and remove some of the things. So for example, an awful lot of the food that crosses the REC to Northern Ireland uh, comes from large UK retailers. Uh, and it, it's how we actually get a bit of sense around that. So the, the, the things that are important, I think, that need to move quickly from my perspective uh, are things like the Northern Ireland Qualifying Good. Who decides what a Northern Ireland Qualifying Good is? Uh, because back to Dave's point, we need to be careful that things that Northern Ireland isn't used as a potential back channel to get goods from other parts of the EU uh, through the back door into the UK, because that's actually to other parts of the UK. That's not what it's about. But uh, uh, how, uh, how closely and how quickly can we work uh, with our colleagues across government, uh, both in, in Whitehall and across the devolved nations? Uh, to get these definitions, we absolutely need urgently so that both the consumer in Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland business. And remember, two thirds of Northern Ireland food product goes to Great Britain. Uh, so we, we, we need to keep that door open and understand. But there's a couple of unanswered questions which I suspect need to be answered in three to four months, not a long time. Unmute. You're absolutely right. And I also uh, think the meeting that you and I and Maria had last week with the minister, it, we're very lucky that Maria is so intensely plugged in to the work there and also to the uh, to the broader food network there. And I would hate any of our stakeholders in Northern Ireland to, to not understand that we absolutely intend to operate and protect consumer interests there to the same extent as we intend to do it in the other two countries in which we operate. This, this is absolutely an equal approach that we're taking uh, to the populations that we're responsible for. Maria. Thanks, Heather. Um, couldn't put it um, better myself for, for your summing up of where I think um, we need to be as an organisation. Um, I just want to remind the board that um, the FSA has a science capability and um, that science capability is for the whole organisation. I don't have any science capability in my small team, so I totally rely on that science capability for um, any work that we will need to do in this space um, for the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, also, um, the risk management decisions need to be taken um, and need to be considered by the board at board level um, and then uh, communicated to ministers. Um, and I totally um, understand uh, that your point um, that there may well have to be adjustments made 
or Northern Ireland because of the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's perfectly fine and reasonable, but the organisation needs to understand those and we need to be making decisions based on where we are with those considerations. Thank you. Margaret and Timothy. Um, all my questions, bar one, have been dealt with, so thank you. Uh, and the, the final one, very simple. Where there's divergence, where uh, Northern Ireland uh, uh, have a ruling from the EU on one thing and the FSA uh, decides that we should be giving different uh, advice to our ministers, uh, what's the mechanism to deal with that? Um, Timothy? Thank you. Yes, I think Margaret's just picked up on one of my points about the protocols for where there might be divergence. And I'd just like to take the opportunity, I think, to reinforce the point around the role of the FSA in relation to standards and consumer confidence. Uh, if anything, the debate around consumer standards on imports, I think, has uh, highlighted that role, as we've seen with the, the NFU petition. So I think we just need to keep asserting that and keeping that uh, in the forefront of people's mind about how our role is actually critical. Thank you. Um, Emily or Paul, who wants to come back on? Uh, I'll start and then Paul can supplement and correct me. Um, so just to, to deal with Colm's point about engagement with other departments first. Um, so engagement did slow because of COVID-19. Um, even the Cabinet Office diverted a huge amount of the resource devoted to Brexit onto, um, onto COVID-19 coordination. Actually, in the last three weeks, that has shifted back. So people are starting, the, the Cabinet committees are starting again, um, the uh, collection of information is starting again. I've just come from a meeting with DEFRA and food industry stakeholders where everyone agreed that Brexit was now the priority. Um, and that uh, indeed the Northern Ireland Protocol needed particular attention. So I, I'm confident that things are improving, um, but we have lost a couple of months, I would say, if not three, um, and there's quite a lot of detail to work through. Um, the divergence question is so tricky to answer, so let me have a go and then Paul can supplement, because um, there are some things that are in, in place and some things that will be in place. So um, uh, we have already been working on a UK framework for some time in relation to food and feed and a couple of other matters where we are trying to, um, and frame, UK frameworks are things that are used across lots of different policy areas, uh, across DEFRA and Bayes policy areas and elsewhere to um, attend to single market questions, single market within the UK questions. And the intention is to provide a mechanism for the different countries to talk to each other, a dispute resolution process if there's disagreement, um, and then the ability to resolve that. And, it, you know, at the top is the Joint Ministerial Committee of Cabinet Ministers, and, and then there's various things sitting underneath. Um, so we are part of that. Um, but in addition, um, what's complicated now is for the highly regulated products, if the EU comes to a different view to us, that obviously isn't part of the UK framework, the Nor Northern Ireland would, um, for products there, would have to submit to the EU arrangements. Um, the mechanism to oversee that at the moment is a joint committee between the EU and the UK, but it's possible that the future uh, trading relationship deal will come to a different arrangement, don't know, so that's the default at the moment, but it's complicated. Um, and uh, in addition, there is also the prospect of some single market legislation for inside the UK, which is being thought through at the moment. So it, it's not simple. Um, but we are, we basically, I think, need to stick to the principle that Heather has described, which is that we think about three countries, the three countries in one go. We work incredibly closely with Food Standards Scotland. We often share um, scientific input, insight on risk management, um, and so on, so that we can, as far as possible, reflect a single market in, inside the UK. Paul, do you want to supplement any of that or add anything? So, I, I mean, I'd I just add that I think some of these issues, uh, when we come back in September to discuss, in addition to the things you've said about the UK frameworks and, and those issues, when we come to discuss the risk assessment and the processes that we're going to go through, which we're discussing in September, in some more detail about how exactly how some of these scenarios will play out and the kind of governance and the approach that we need to, to take to on that. And I also just wanted to pick up one other point as well, um, Colm mentioned on the Northern Ireland qualifying goods. Um, we've been very clear in our discussion with other governments Departments, how critical that is to uh, to, to us and, and the movement of, of goods, obviously between Northern Ireland and, and GB. Um, it's just worth emphasising that that is a there's a kind of a decision that the UK government will make. It's not something they consult. Uh, 
the commission on or, or even necessarily the other um, devolved administrations, although we'll need to keep on talking through what the practicalities of that. But that's a, a decision they're making. We are, through the processes that Emily is talking about, just, just really making clear that it, it, it's understood uh, how important that is to us and, and the, uh, the integrity of our controls. But you know, Emily's, Emily's sort of set out the, the complications and the confusion uh, that uh, we will need to pick our way through in, in, the, in the coming months. Thank you very much for that. I was just going to also record, I think I'm right in saying uh, that the IPAF's pre-notification system for food being imported to this country, which the board has been concerned to ensure was operational in terms of high risk food coming from the EU within a short period of time after we'd finally severed our links and got through the transition period. I think I'm right in saying that we have got assurance from DEFRA that that will be operating in the way that we need it to. Uh, within a few months of exit, um, the transition period ending. Right? That's, that's correct. So um, uh, DEFRA are expecting to meet FSA requirements um, around pre-notification of products of animal origin from uh, within the EU from April next year. Um, uh, not least because, um, so there was a question about whether that module of IPAFs was going to get built and whether there was sufficient, sufficient funding for it. DEFRA are now starting to build that. They are um, hoping to get some additional money um, to make sure that gets covered, but they're, they're committed to doing so. So although we won't have it in place from the 1st of January, we think um, if it's in place by the 1st of April, that will be fine. The board's been really clear that six months would be a tolerable um, amount of... tolerable uh, the board's view. <laughs> There we go. So we, we're hoping that within three months, um, the IPATH module will be in place. Thank you. And the only other point I was going to mention was that we touched on it last time we talked about EU exit and standards was, uh, and the consumer's wider interest in relation to food was the growing importance of antimicrobial resistance and its impact on public health, which is a global issue, not, not just a national issue. And that's also a component which is being fed into the way that our official colleagues are looking in to that analysis. Uh, we have a, uh, our annual report on antimicrobial resistance coming up, I think at the next meeting or the next bundle of meetings, uh, we might be able to talk about that a little bit further there. Thank you very much for all of that. I think we're going to have our break now because we've taken longer than we expected on all of those items, but they were um, incredibly important debates and discussions for us to have. So we'll take a 10 minute break and we will reconvene uh, for our Chief Scientific Advisors uh, and we'll report to the board. Thank you. So um, every year um, I, I give a, a, a reflection on, on how I feel uh, science is looking at the FSA, some of the opportunities, some of the challenges in it. And this particular year, you know, it's obviously it's my final year and also it's hopefully useful for you and my successor, Professor Robin May. Um, for joining the organization. I think it's important to flag that the FSA actually was established partly as a consequence of a national emergency. And, and in establishing it, it was to actually restore confidence amongst the public in terms of food. And, and, and so it's quite um, relevant. Now, we're in another big emergency. And I think what you're seeing and observing is the central role that science and evidence plays in helping us address such an emergency. Whether that be the advice which is fed in with the other legitimate factors which we've been hearing about in terms of for those people that are making the decisions, or whether it be the, the wonderful news announced yesterday of a repurposing of a drug, dexamethasone, which will help crucially, uh, critically ill people um, in hospital. And, and so I think that kind of, whether it be why the FSA was established 20 years ago or what was happening now, it kind of really does illustrate, you know, the fundamental and key part that science has. The other thing I've learned in my six years in the FSA is that most people always like to say I've got three things to mention, which is why I chose to have three things uh, in this um, report. And uh, I'll run through. I always hate giving the number just in case you forget the last one, so people realise there's one missing. But, but so that I mean, we we've heard a lot already about risk analysis, and obviously we we published the uh, one of my the ninth report I've written since being in post. Um, and and I think this has become very important 
not because this was work that we've been doing and the board have been supporting for some time now in terms of preparing us for exiting the EU. It also, I think, becomes very important in the post-COVID world, actually, of this really understanding how the science and evidence of risk assessment fits into the risk management and the other legitimate factors coming in that, and then how you communicate the risk to others. And I think the FSA has actually, as we've heard again, and Emily's given some statistics, has significantly increased its capability in science. But I think importantly, some of those external um, experts that we have on our committees, and, and this is my, I suppose my first kind of important reflection here, we have to make more use of them. I mean, they are very willing, they're very able, and quite often we perhaps don't use them as much as we might. A really real-world example is in the uh, very complicated situation to do with CBD. And in fact, the bringing in of the Committee of Toxicology to help us determine an upper threshold limit was, I think, crucial in terms of enabling some of the breakthroughs in that space. And similarly, the risk assessment we made in terms of whether food or food surfaces and packaging were a contributor to the COVID pandemic. Again, our advisory committee on microbiological safety of food were crucial in terms of helping give that external confidence and assurance associated um, with that. I think the other final thing to say in terms of the risk analysis, I, you know, as I say in my report, is that it, it, we have developed, I think, a, a world-leading uh, process which is open and transparent and people can see what fits in where. But at this moment in time, in spite of exercises we've done to challenge it, there is nothing like challenging it for real. And, and again, I suppose the word of caution is, is we should remain agile and responsive to the learning as the situation evolves and we get real um, pressures, real targets, real things coming through and the curved balls, which can sometimes come in from the side. So that is a very workable system, but we mustn't uh, um, either have no risk appetite for making some important kind of potential advice of which we've heard a bit about earlier or no risk appetite for actually evolving it as the situation moves forward. The second thing is in terms of FSA science. And I think um, you know, when Lord Krebs was appointed as the first chair of the FSA, I think he put science at the heart of its action, something we've always been proud of. And as I said in my report, you know, I'm really grateful to Heather and, um, and the rest of the board for really um, living up to that um, statement and as shown in so many ways the fact that I'm here speaking to you today the fact that science is represented in so many of the board papers and I think that is, is, is a really important aspect. Our science council I think is stronger than ever and is playing an important role in feeding in to the work of the FSA and I think things like our strategic evidence fund are real you know these are envied by other government departments who look at the FSA and say, well, that is a way that we can have science and evidence at the heart of what we do. And, and I think we should certainly do everything in our, uh, in our capability to try and ensure when we get bandwidth back from COVID and, and EU exit, that things like the Strategic Evidence Fund, we put in effort to actually use, our, use that to the best of our abilities. And then the final thing I mentioned here is in the food system. And I think, again, what Emily has flagged earlier is that one of the real big challenges in terms of the COVID was the fact that whilst we might not have had the direct food safety type aspect, other legitimate factors in relation to food came out loud and very clear. And so, who, who, I mean, 20 years ago when the FSA was established, you know, in spite of all of our best efforts, it would have probably been hard to predict dark kitchens. It would have certainly been hard to predict COVID and a range of other things. And, and, and it's always very hard to predict, but I do think that the development of the strategic surveillance and the horizon scanning um, have been really useful in terms of meaning that we are far more on the front foot of seeing what might be coming and, and how we need to respond. I think the, the national food strategy that Henry Dimbledy is, is developing and he spoke about at a recent board meeting, and in fact the new Transforming UK Food System programme that I'm, I'm going to be directing, are going to be essential in terms of building back the new normal for the UK food system. 
Um, and it's important that that new normal is for healthy people and a healthy environment. And, I, and I'm hoping that all of you will join in on the fact that the role and the significant role that the FSA has in playing in that. So for the next 20 years, in fact, actually, it might be difficult to consider what the next 20 weeks might look like at this moment in time. But for the next 20 years, I think the FSA can put the consumer first. And it can do that by being a modern, accountable, excellent regulator. And I think the new risk analysis process enables that to happen. The way we responded to some of the challenges of COVID have fully shown that too. But at times as well, being a non-ministerial government department is essential for helping when it isn't a regulatory approach that you might use to try and ensure that the UK food system is safe, trusted and healthy. And I think the important aspect there, which has been cruelly exposed by COVID, but I think we perhaps were seeing the signs of it before. But when we talk about a safe, trusted and healthy food system, I think importantly, we should be saying that that is for everybody, wherever they live, wherever they, uh, whatever environment they find themselves and whatever life experience they're currently experiencing. Thank you. Guy, thank you very much indeed. Your point about involving our science experts, our independent scientific committees more, is really well made. I know you've raised it with Sandy Thomas, who chairs our Science Council, and I've uh, reinforced it with her. And it's also firmly on the agenda of your successor as an important handover baton uh, for you to uh, to give to him. So I'm, I'm confident that we will not will not lose sight of any of this really good uh, advice and learning and lessons, but that one specifically action already in train. Mary and then Margaret. Hi, so, sorry, um, un unmute issue there. Um, thank you, Gar. I mean, you've been, I know we'll talk about it before, um, later, but um, you've been amazing, uh, you know, always lending tremendous insight into whatever we're discussing, uh, you know, um, guiding the way that we see stuff. Um, just looking at the, um, given that um, food standards are now a really live issue, um, you know, with the campaigns going on around us. In terms of the other legitimate interests in food um, uh, that consumers have, uh, and you refer to economics as being one of those interests, I'm not, I'm not completely sure that we have, we certainly don't have a, an advisory committee on economic science in the way that we have on social science or other things. It, uh, are the, is that a gap? Are there, especially if we're looking at... Um, food availability for everybody. Uh, I mean, is that a gap or are there other gaps that you can see? I'm going to let Margaret come in next and then oh, we'll... Lovely, thank you. Um, Guy, fascinating paper, absolutely fascinating, so thank you. Um, in your report, you raised the um, huge achievements that you've made on um, AMR. And I wondered if you had worries that there may be any significant risk of reversing the work that you've done in reducing antibiotics in food um, if a trade deal goes um, in a direction, or any trade deal really, which may go in a direction uh, which could end up with the public eating more food from animals given antibiotics, and um, what you therefore um, think the FSA can do about that or should be doing about that? And um, Ruth, and then we'll revert to Guy. Oh, thank you. Um, Guy, really uh, helpful uh, paper and report. Um, and we'll say more about um, the, the, how valued your contribution has been over the years. Um, uh, I... I think it's uh, important that when we show our appreciation for the science and the evidence, we also think about have we got robust mechanisms for asking the right questions? Of uh, the system that, that uh, surrounded you and um, the importance of understanding what happens on the ground, whether it's frontline practitioners, whether it's consumer, and um, whether you think um, we, we have enough focus on asking the questions that matter 
uh, to individuals and communities. Um, you talk about the statement of areas of research interest and, and producing that so that academia and others know what we're interested in. Do you think we, we need to consider any further how we get to a position where we're asking absolutely the right questions? Guy, shall I come back to you now? Uh, um, thank you. Um, so, so in relation to uh, Mary's um, question, I think um, whilst we don't have a, an, an advisory committee on economics, we do have economists on our advisory committee on uh, social sciences. And in fact, in the, in the social science space, because obviously it's such a huge and broad topic, we have a list of experts of several hundred, in, including many economists. So there is the opportunity there to, to work with um, people from an economic kind of specialism in terms of offering kind of where we need a detailed economic analysis. And in fact, the economist team within the FSA also have a very good working relationship with um, organisations like London School of Economics and, 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 and various other, you know, really well um, kind of recognised uh, uh, um, experts in economics. So I, so I do think we have that. But obviously, one of the things is that if... Um, if in the future uh, we recognise that this other consumer interest becomes more and more important in terms of the advice that we are making on some of these, shall we say, more challenging areas of food, which as against, say, shall we say, the highly very technical kind of limits of cadmium or, or something like that, then we have the opportunity like we've done in the past to kind of dial up the capability within the organisation or outside the organisation to help us with that. Uh, in 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 terms of Margaret, I mean, I, I, I mean as many others on the uh, on this um, call will know, I mean, antimicrobial resistance and the and the need to show global leadership and and rise to the challenge is something very close to my heart, and 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 in fact, actually, um, you know, I, 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 as I've said before, you know, uh, COVID illustrates to you a world when you don't have an agent which can either vaccinate you or protect you from um, something until obviously the good news of yesterday. So, so you know, the, 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 it's come to the fore, I think, in terms of what uh, the loss of antimicrobial um, medicines and uh, products would, would mean to us. In terms of, you mentioned in, 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 in future trading aspects, I think one of the things that the FSA has played a very major role in through Steve Wern's uh, vice presidentship of Codex is working with Codex Elementarius, i.e. the global uh, standard setting body in things such as AMR just being one of them of which they have a working group looking at it so so in that sense we can actually work on that international search stage to make sure that there is a level playing field across uh, the globe in terms of that space and, and then in terms of roof some comment I missed some of it so I don't know if it dropped out for uh, anybody um, else but um, from what from what I could um, pick up you you you're asking basically about how what what sort of mechanisms we use to make sure we're asking the right questions and perhaps from a diverse audience of people what these right questions might be and and, and i think that's where uh, again one of the things that i i think has really um in, impressed me in in the last six years uh with the fsa is the actual wide, wide range of stakeholder groups that they consult and work with whether that be lots of discussions with industry with consumer groups there's, there's several thousand people that are part of a consumer panel that the fsa regular work with and consult or whether it be with other regulatory um uh, organizations or or as i've just said you know the increasing presence on the global stage of working with them so i think the key aspect there is firstly as you know in terms of the prioritization of some of the things we might work on we're, we're developing a toolbox which enables us to kind of weigh up is it to do with cost to the economy quality measures or or, or kind of frequency of incident um, we can work with the you know the, the the public at large in terms of beginning to get an understanding of what really concerns them 
and, and why they might view something as a, a possibility. Working with industry in terms of saying, right, if you've got four options, option one is probably the one that's most easiest for us to introduce, and therefore you're going to get traction on. I, 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 so I think we've come a long way in terms of doing that. But ultimately, all of these, refer, all these things kind of re require a judgment call. And, and I suppose my call to arms of you, the board and the executive, and it, raised, it was raised earlier in terms of risk appetite, is, you know, sometimes you can have all the evidence and all the metrics you need, but you need to make the judgment call and, uh, and give an explanation as to why that is the call you're making. Guy, thank you. At one point, Dave, your hand was up, but I think it's down now. Yeah. I was just going to share with the board, Emily very kindly shared with me a letter that the Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Patrick Balance, had written to permanent secretaries at the beginning of June. And it was about the importance of the CSA role and, and wanting <coughs> departments to ensure that they were making it possible for Chief Scientific Advisors to make the best possible contribution. And there were three particular things that Sir Patrick drew attention to. How important it was that was a close, effective relationship between chief scientific advisors and the science system and the analytical function in a department. The need to be able to access rapidly diverse external sources of science and expertise. And uh, how important it was that interactions were built across the CSA network and with national laboratories so that chief scientific advisors could collectively tackle strategic cross-cutting challenges. Um, and that included the connection with UKRI. And uh, I felt when I saw that, that Guy has done an exemplary job in not being only about the pure science in the FSA. He definitely has a remit, which is across the whole of the FSA from this board. We want and expect him and his successor to be as engaged in regulatory compliance issues as he is in Rick's area of, of our operations. Um, and I think that's a really important way in which our CSA adds value. He's not there just to mark the homework of the science team. And um, we've already heard from Guy about the scientific advisory uh, committees and the science council, and he's done outstanding work in strengthening um, the source of expertise that we've got there. And he's also done an incredible job in positioning the FSA in that uh, wider government CSA network um, in terms of his connection with the UKRI, the job he's going on to, I think, really reinforces that. So I felt, when I really shared that letter, that we can't be complacent, but I thought that we got a reasonably good mark um, if we were going to be sending a report back in to the government's chief scientific advisor about the way we embrace and encourage our own CSA to roam as freely as he wishes with all the support, resource and expertise he can draw on. Uh, to, do, uh, to do the right thing for the consumer, which is ultimately what we're here for. Do you think there's anything else on your report there, Guy? So thank you very much for that. And we'll come back to you later. Um, we've then got a couple of additional items on the agenda. Um, we did ask the um, Audit and Risk Advisory Committee to ensure that, to have a look at the guidance that we've done on managing interests of our scientific advisors uh, to make sure that that was also uh, properly considered in terms of the interests of our food advisory committee members. And Com's done a report which lets us know where the ARAC committee got to with that. Com. Chair, sure, thank you. And as I say, I will be brief on both this and, and, and the next item. Uh, this, the, uh, as you just said, the, the following the exercise we did a couple of years ago in 2019. On the scientific advisors, we decided that the board decided to have the track to have a look at the other advisory, non-scientific advisory committees, largely NIFAC and, and, uh, and WIFAC. Uh, the paper effectively formalises the position that has been the normal practice in these committees for, for some years. Uh, it's an important reminder of the importance of keeping registers of interests up to date. Uh, declaring interest, these are ministerial appointments uh, in both Wales and Northern Ireland, so declaring interest is de facto part of the recruitment process, but it is really important to keep them up to date and, and, and refresh them on, on a regular basis. So the papers there are uh, is a very, very similar to what we've put in place for scientific advisory committees. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. If there aren't any questions, and I can't see any, then I'm assuming that the board is happy to accept the advice of ARAC in terms of adopting this guidance on managing interests 
for the FSA's external non-scientific advisors. Yes, we are. Thank you very much, Cole. And your report on the ARAC meeting. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, ARAC uh, met twice on the 18th of May and the 10th of June, primarily to consider the annual report and accounts. Just given the, the COVID pressures on the executive, we did reduce the agenda significantly to concentrate on these. <clears throat> these were completed to a very high standard and important to say on the normal time scale uh, for the FSA, despite the fact. So in other words, uh, every year we meet in May and June and sign off on the accounts in time to be laid uh, before the end of, of the month. Uh, and we continue to do that despite the pressures on the executive team, which we've talked about earlier. Uh, ARAC, on behalf of the board, were satisfied with the accounts uh, and all of the documents and were able to recommend digital sign-off by the accounting officer, by Emily, uh, for digital transmission uh, to the CNAG. Uh, and hopefully that, that, that's all been done. Uh, we expect, subject to the CNAG approval, that Northern Ireland and Wales accounts will be laid um, before their assemblies during the week commencing the 22nd of June, which is next week. Westminster and consolidated accounts will be delayed due to uh, third party assurance, which is required on the London Pensions uh, Authority, uh, which will affect the FSA in a very small way. Uh, and we expect those to lay in early September after the summer recess. Uh, we also received an update on cybersecurity in May and a very good discussion in June on risk management. Uh, we were able to, uh, uh, and we've talked earlier about risk appetite, but we were able to manage uh, the very difficult situation around COVID within the, uh, the risk appetite structures that Emily articulated so well earlier in the meeting. Uh, and we did consider a number of other papers, uh, but didn't have a huge discussion as, as it wasn't necessary. Uh, but again, happy to take any questions, but the, the, the accounts were, uh, and congratulations to the team uh, to get the accounts uh, done uh, to such a tremendously high standard. Uh, but more importantly, they're one of the very few uh, bodies within the public sector anywhere in the UK that has actually delivered accounts in time. And bear in mind that Treasury have, have given a two or three month derogation on, on delivering accounts later if necessary. We didn't use that and delivered on time, so well done. Colm, thank you. Yes, well done indeed. I, I think I'm right. We had the same issue on this London uh, Pensions Fund Authority last year. and We just put on the record then, it's, it's not about the FSA. It's a wider issue in terms of the audit and assurance of that pension fund, isn't it? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. The, uh, the, the, this was an issue last year. Uh, the FSA are a very small player in this pension scheme. Uh, it's, but it does go across local government and national government in a much bigger way. So, uh, yes, it's, it's something that will affect many sets of accounts. And, and there's a little two-week gap uh, between uh, the end of summer recess and the conference season that we, we all need to get accounts laid. So we're, we're, we're aiming for that. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the board or board members who weren't part of the ARAC discussion on that no, in which case, Colm, it's really helpful having your quick written report shortly after the ARAC meeting. So thank you very much for, for doing that. I think it adds a lot of uh, colour and uh, insight to the uh, record of the meeting. Uh, reports or updates from our Food Advisory Committee chairs. Ruth, anything from you? Uh, just to say that um, the committee met virtually last week and discussed the board papers um, uh, that we've uh, received today and uh, we'll continue to modify how it works going forward uh, so that it's able to, to uh, continue that role uh, with the modified uh, approach uh, to our board meetings. Um, we had been working on a food landscape, a food system paper uh, for Wales as has Northern Ireland uh, and obviously things have changed immensely, potentially, uh, since we were completing our work. We didn't have the final contribution that we wanted in April, um, but our intention is to complete the work as it stands. Um, and I think it would be interesting then to come back to the issue in some months' time to look at how the system has actually adapted and modified since we did that initial work. So um, we will complete that shortly. And... Um, think about how we can update it as we understand how uh, systems are changing uh, around us. Thank you very much. And Cole? 
Uh, very, very similar to Ruth, actually. We did have a session back in uh, April, just to get an update on where we were. And we had a session last week ahead of today's board meeting. Uh, we have one plan, uh, again, in closed session in the uh, third week in July, uh, particularly to look at EU exit and the issues around that, particularly from the Northern Ireland Protocol perspective. Uh, but similarly, we, we, we'll see how uh, we will progress through the course of the year. We, we Our next sort of uh, open meeting will, is planned for October. Uh, and uh, we, we we will have an open meeting at that stage. It may be virtual. We, we just have to see how we we're, we're operating at that time. Similar to Wales, we have produced the uh, the landscape paper, which members will have an opportunity to see in the weekly board update. Uh, we didn't uh, again like Wales. We we had a session planned for April, which wasn't able to go ahead. Uh, and we we we'll use what we have done today as a benchmark, and then take it from there as we as we move forward. Hopefully from October. Thank you. Anything board members wish to pick up there? In which case, uh, one item of any other business before we finish this board meeting, and that's to put on record our sincere thanks and appreciation to Guy Poppy. And you saw in his report, he's been here for six years. He created the role of Chief Scientific Advisor for the Food Standards Agency. And I think I reflect the view of the entire board that that has been an exceptional contribution to public health and to confidence and trust in the FSA uh, from the, the word go. And um, we can't go through all the reports you've done as CSA, all nine of them, we've received one of them today, but I'm particularly struck by your work on the microbiome, uh, by the proof point that we had on FHRS ratings and their connection to foodborne disease and, and the risk of foodborne disease by your pioneering work in, on data where the FSA's leadership in that area and, and Julie and others has been really reinforced by the networks and connections that you've brought, not least the data science opportunity that you created with the Turing Institute. I think it's important to place on record the significant contribution or influence you had on the O'Neill report on antimicrobial resistance and ensuring that recognised that food was an important component of how, of how we thought about AMR guy. And then of course, that whole area of AMR and the microbiome harnessed to the partnership you're instrumental in is creating with the Quadrum Institute. So across the piece, you have made a really significant contribution. I think it's really important also to recognize your willingness to share your um, professional standing and your personal network to the good of the FSA. That's really benefited, that benefited us in terms of the quality and calibre and eminence of the scientists that we've been able to recruit to our independent advisory committees. Um, and it, it takes a lot to encourage someone or to force someone to decide that they're going to uh, let us access all of that. And we really appreciate it. And I think we have had our own reputation burnished because of your personal standing and the, the high regard in which you're held. Um, and that's been visible also from the way in which you've been involved and instrumental in the wider government office uh, CSA network. So for all of those things, we are incredibly grateful. That's a tiny summary, a tiny snapshot of the things that you've contributed to the FSA. Uh, we're going to really miss you. I think I personally want to say how much I have benefited from working with you and learned from you. And I've really enjoyed it. So we're looking forward to your drinks, your virtual drinks leaving party in a week's time. Uh, but it has been a privilege for us all to work with you and thank you for your contribution. You're allowed to say something if you want. Well, I mean, well, I mean many thanks for your kind words. I mean, I, you know, I'm grateful to the organisation for giving me the chance, giving me the chance to step outside of the world of academia, which is the world I spent all of my career in. And, uh, and I've learned huge amounts from all of you too. Uh, you know, levels of professionalism, levels of uh, public responsibility, and kind of a, a, a real sort of duty to do one's best for the common good, rather than perhaps one's own CV. And uh, and and I think you know that really has had a massive impact on me. And I, I've I've learned a lot. I'm a certainly a more complete uh, person. 
you know, net leaving the FSA than I was kind of arriving to it. And uh, as you can probably tell, I've lost a lot of weight in lockdown because I'm back on the bike in a big way, having got a bit more time. So, um, and, and I look forward to doing that <laughs> in the future too. But but I'd like to thank you all all for your support. And uh, and it's been a wonderful time. And I, I, I'm really, really glad I took the chance when it was offered to me. Thank you. And that concludes our board meeting. Um, we are now going to move straight into the business committee of the FSA. Um, and we'll start, uh, there are no, no apologies. Uh, we will start with the minutes of our business committee meeting on the 11th of March. Again, committee members have seen these in draft. So I am hoping we are happy to accept them as a, an accurate record of our meeting. Yes, we are. Um, Actions arising, um, noted just one action arising, which is in progress. Is there anything anybody wishes to raise about that? No, in which case, Emily, we're back with you. I'm glad you're back with us. You disappeared for a moment. Yeah, there's a big, there's a big thunderstorm happening in South London at the moment. It knocked out my uh, internet connection for a few minutes, including on all my phones. So it's quite exciting. Um, so I'm assuming you've all read the paper, uh, just to, to highlight a few things. Um, obviously, this business committee focus, focuses on internal and corporate matters for the FSA, so funding, finances, resourcing, culture, communications, internal communications and operations. Um, I've, I've mentioned a number of senior staff moves um, that we've made partly because of um, because of the COVID-19 situation. So just to reiterate a huge thanks to everyone for being so flexible, but Colin Sullivan is covering as instant director, Maria Jennings as deputy instant director, Martin Evans, who you mentioned earlier, has postponed his retirement um, in order to stay with us until the end of July and is covering as chief operating officer. Um, I'm very grateful to Rob Locker, who covered therefore for Martin as operations uh, manager and uh, Simon Tunnicliffe, who's just arrived to take over from him. Paul Morrison's taken on the SRO ship, the Senior Responsible Officer ship of the Achieving Business Compliance Programme from Maria. And then there was one that I didn't mention, I just wanted to uh, make the board aware of. So Steve Wern, who is our Global Affairs Director, we were we were hoping he, there was going to be an election for the Codex Chair in June, um, uh, sorry, in July. Uh, actually, that meeting of the Codex Alimentarius has been postponed because of um, COVID-19, because it wasn't possible to meet in person and because um, this needs to be a, um, a secret ballot. We're not actually not expecting that to happen now until next year, possibly another 12 months. Um, so Steve is going to stay with us for that period, working part-time as our Global Affairs Director and also offering um, support to DEFRA and at the same time is still Vice Chair of Codex Alimentarius. And then we are gaining Professor Robin May at the beginning of July, who um, happens to be an expert in pathogens in host organisms, which is rather useful to us and to the country. Um, and we're losing Guy, which Heather has just referred to, which is very sad for us. Um, the, the report outlines the impact of COVID-19 on us internally. So you, you can see over time, the fact people have had to work very flexibly, the way that we've, um, we're have we very grateful to our IT and digital colleagues for our ability to work from home and the kit that they managed to get to us, the effect, particularly on some of our black and minority ethnic staff who've lost family members or friends, family members who haven't been able to go to funerals, which we've been hearing about and are feeling very, very sad about. Um, we had planned for 20% absence. It's actually been more like five to 10% absence in operations. Um, and we've massively increased our communication with staff. So the, I've been doing all staff video calls about once a fortnight. Um, there's been uh, significant operations calls in the evenings because obviously people are doing shifts. Um, and then lots of traffic on our intranet um, and blogs being written and so on. Just a sense of people putting their arms around each other and supporting each other has been very tangible. Um, the report finishes with a couple of things about operations. I just wanted to put on the record, um, we've, we have withdrawn service from three abattoirs in the last um, few weeks where there has been alleged nasty bullying and harassment of our staff. Um, which we consider to be completely unacceptable. Um, so we have withdrawn um, service. In some of those instances, we've gone back, having had undertakings from, um, from the 
food business where we were operating, but this is a matter of deep concern to us. Um, and we will we will act swiftly on it. And then you've got the usual information on prosecutions. Thank you. Thank you. Anything that anybody wishes to pick up there? Yes, Mary. Um, thank you. Uh, great report as always. Um, do, uh, um, about the, you were talking about the labour uh, availability in slaughterhouses. Um, do we expect the upcoming quarantine restrictions to um, uh, to place additional burdens on that? And you also mentioned about the obviously um, closing down the the uh, uh, not providing service to businesses where there's been bullying of a, of our staff. What about the indication of uh, internal bullying? How have we, how are we dealing with that? I don't know. We uh, we don't have. Yes, we do. No, we don't have Martin with us now. So I don't know whether Colin, would you like to pick that up? Yeah. Um, so just a number of things there in relation to uh, operational matters, and Martin is on the line, so he can come in and, and add to it. Um, so uh, we're very alive to, to bullying, uh, whether it be internal or external, and it's it's something that uh, uh, can can show up in a people survey report, and and so where that is uh, flagged, um, we will act immediately. Uh, we've had zero tolerance approach to it, both internally or externally. Um, in terms of the staffing levels uh, for meat plants. Um, and Tim asked a similar question at the board meeting in terms of temp, uh, test and trace. Um, so the, uh, as Emily has said, the, the absence levels have been around five, 10 percent max. Um, uh, we actually have prepared uh, on the basis that um, we could have an absence of somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. Um, so we, we, we're facing a possibility impacts on, a, on, a, on a, in, uh, plants whenever test and trace kicks in. Um, we're not sure, obviously, how, how, to the extent of, uh, that that will have. Um, um, uh, we, we, we're aware of the fact that uh, we're going into the holiday period and there's, there's leave and we've got Kobani at the end of July. But we're, we've got those easements, we've got the, um, uh, uh, the contingency plan, and, and at the moment we're keeping our head uh, above water in, in relation to, to um, the, the requirements. Shall I, shall I supplement a little? Um, so on the, um, uh, on the question about quarantine, so there is a particular issue because um, Evelyn Jones, our main uh, supplier of official vets, um, has, I think it's 95% or so of, the, of their staff uh, come from outside of the UK, mainly, mainly from the EU. Um, and they have a bit of a turnover, so between 12 and 15 new vets that start each month. Um, they are, will be exempt from the quarantine requirements. However, the first week of their work is done as online training um, when they arrive into the new job. And also we will be testing them um, for COVID-19 before they start. Um, so that, that should mitigate any risk um, on the quarantine front of that affecting, um, affecting labour availability. On the bullying front, so we we um, we covered this quite a lot at the last business committee meeting as well, because we were covering the staff survey results. We do; um, it, it is absolutely unacceptable, um, and there's there's a lot of stuff we are doing inside um, on culture, on um, management training. Uh, we have a team that's able to go and do deep dives and uh, work with particular teams if there appears to be an issue going on um, and, and some of this is about improving skills of our managers and we have a management fundamentals program that all of our folk go through and um, Maria may want to say a little bit more about that. Maria. Heather, I think that covers it all. If Emily has touched on everything um, that I would have said, other than um, we, we have a team of volunteers within the organisation as well, um, and they're, they are there just to provide a listening ear for people who um, feel that they need to talk to someone outside their own management structures about um, potential bullying and harassment. And those people signpost um, individuals to different uh, uh, places, help and support, and also obviously support them if they want to raise grievances or um, some other um, 
method that they can um, get res get um, a resolution to their concerns. Thank you. I think possibly Martin wanted to come in. Oh, thanks, Emily. Um, Maria was just making reference there, I think, to the um, an internal um, piece of work that we've done that's called a mood checker. And um, what we're doing is we're giving people the opportunity to a very simple form, three simple questions to be able to complete that. And it goes to three individuals uh, and they can sort through and look for incidents. Uh, and that's that's really helping me uh, in operations to be able to focus our attention on where we need to. Um, the bullying harassment is a big issue for us. And as Emily says, we continually retrain people. We continually focus on it. Uh, and our health, safety and well-being team are really keen uh, that we, we push on in that area. And as you know, uh, as Emily mentioned, we re removed the, the um, attendance from three premises and we have a zero tolerance approach to this. Uh, and I spend a lot of time talking to, to stakeholders in, in regular meetings around how they deal with our staff and how they, how they approach them and speak to them. And we've, gone, we've come a long way in a short period of time, but there's still more to do. Thank you, Martin. I think we just want to, to reiterate, as ever, that the board is four square uh, in terms of um, our intolerance of bullying and harassment of our staff, whether that's by third parties or by colleagues across the organisation. It's just not an acceptable way for anyone to behave. So you absolutely have our active support and backing for all those measures. We will move on then to the performance uh, and resources report from Chris, which is about a different era, really, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so this looks back to Q4 um, and, and the quarter ending 31st of March and reviews our performance on our key measures and resources. Um, Board members will have, will have noticed that the um, overall the performance has been has been strong um, on not only the performance measures but also the resources. There's a few things that I just wanted to highlight from the report. Um, the first one is obviously to highlight the main areas of focus in the report, which is brought out on slide three in the forward. Um, We've heard already a lot about the um, the priority which was emerging at the back end of Q4 on COVID. Um, and how that's impacted our work. And there'll be more, obviously, in the next paper from uh, introduced by Sam um, on how that's impacted this year's work and prioritisation. Um, EU exit, we've already heard about, um, so I won't highlight any areas there. And we've also touched on ABC and um, some of the impacts um, that have landed on the local authorities in particular in light of COVID. In terms of business as usual, um, slide five are headline metrics of foodborne disease and our ambition to obviously um, keep that as uh, low as possible. It's obviously a very complex area and Guy's already touched on how we're using qualies um, to, to better understand what goes on in those foodborne disease metrics and to help us prioritize our work uh, and delivery. So that's, um, that's a key slide that only appears once a year um, and all four metrics are showing a downward trend, which is reassuring. The final point that I wanted to bring out of the report was on the resources. Um, we've already heard from Colm about the annual report and accounts and how um, the resources overall are on track. And the only thing to, to reiterate is that that is obviously pending the final um, independent audit on the pensions work for Westminster and Consolidated. So I'll pause there and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chris. And I don't think we would want uh, anyone to, to think that we have overlooked in any way the efforts that have been made in the finance and wider team uh, under your leadership in this, uh, in this crisis and all the implications of it, because you've got to keep the money in the right places, doing the right things with all the right accountabilities and governance sitting around it. So thank you very much for that. I've got Timothy, then Mary, then Ruth. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think it was a great report and I think it shows incredible progress. Um, I was particularly taken by the human cases of foodborne disease and uh, you rightly mentioned around the use of qualities. I wonder if there's some opportunity to represent this in perhaps uh, a more publicly digestible form so that people can understand the good and progress that the FSA has made 
um, particularly at a time where we are concerned about unnecessary or perhaps avoidable uh, loss of life and morbidity. Um, and is there something we could perhaps do to present this in a way that people will understand simply uh, and really just, I think, to celebrate some of the work and progress that's been achieved? Thank you. Ma Mary. Thanks, Chair. Um, j just wanting to reflect on the animal welfare statistics in slaughterhouses and, um, and the recent uh, all-party parliamentary group on animal welfare, which came out very much in support of small abattoirs. And I wonder whether, you know, um, I may, that in that it made some recommendations about perhaps the use of OVs, um, uh, differential use in the, in the use of OVs, I'm just wondering if we've got any comments. I know it's only just come out on that. Thank you. Uh, shall we pick up those two components first? Uh, Chris, do you want to come back on Timothy's point? And then I think it might be, uh, I know Emily's been engaged as well as Martin and, and Colin and others on the small laboratories. Chris. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And obviously, um, Guy and um, Rick, if he's still on the line, may have more to add alongside Julie on um, on foodborne disease. Obviously, it's um, there is lots of work that goes on um, around foodborne foodborne disease, um, and um, there have been a number of reports that have been published. They they tend to be um, not annual reports necessarily. Um, because there's a huge amount of work and resource that goes into um, getting a really good understanding of, of the foodborne disease metrics. And it's usually the IID reports that really give us the platform for that information. So um, I fully support uh, Tim, Tim's request, um, but obviously caveat the amount of resource um, that, we, that we need to put into that. Thank you for that, um, Emily. On the... Sorry, uh, oh, someone else wants to come in. It's, sorry, it's Julie. I was just going to follow up on um, Tim's question. Um, and and I, I think reminding ourselves as to the, the value that we have here and the potential audience in um, the consumers, the population at, at large, um, we'll, we'll take that challenge on, on board. And I think the work that we're doing to take forward cost of illness generally um, and, and what it what does it mean? What does it tell us? How might we um, take it forward and, and help inform both our priorities and, and policy setting? Um, as part of that work, I think we can pick up the point to make sure that it is presented in as consumable um, way as, as possible. So we'll make sure that that is, is done as well. Thank you. I'm going to give, give, bring Guy in to give his salutary warning on these numbers. I'm guessing what you want to say, Guy. Yeah, well, it's not. It's not so much the the war. I, I think we've had the, we've had discussions before about the fact of um, you know when you look at most of these patterns. Although, whilst Chris says there's a sort of downward trend, you know the one which would stand up to rigorous statistical analysis there is Salmonella, and, and, and we and, and that really is your success story. And we know quite a lot behind why that has happened. Uh, vaccinating flocks, uh, various interventions during the supply chain, such that the FSA revisited its advice to do with uh, you know runny eggs and vulnerable uh, consumers a little while ago. So I mean, one has to be cautious with some of those other things and how you couldn't kind of present them to tell a particular story. Uh, following on from what Timmy Fee was saying, I mean, I, I think that actually taking that Salmonella story which interestingly has spanned the entire life of the FSA actually. is It was one of the things that started just before the FSA is formed and, and during the FSA's 20 years has um, caused that dramatic drop that you see there. And in fact, we've been doing lots of international comparisons, which we hope to be able to present soon. And Salmonella is one of the international comparisons where we have a great success story within the UK to compare with others. So, so I think actually we should perhaps take Salmonella as a working example to explore some of the issues that Timothy raises, because I think the other ones are a little bit too noisy and it might be a bit difficult to do. 
Thank you, Guy. Uh, Rick, did you want to come on that as well? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it is, it is a, it's a very good point that Tim raises. And I think we, we, we could go back and look at it. As you know, we've had a whole range of work, significant work around the cost of illness stuff, the new foodborne disease estimates, the Novas work. Um, there's ongoing work, as, as guys alluded to, with international comparisons. We're looking at IID3. Um, it's been delayed because of COVID-19, but, but that's still a piece of work that will be going on. So there's a whole range of work. And I think it might be a nice time to take a review. As, as has been mentioned earlier, we have the areas of research interest, of which we, we have areas around foodborne disease. It could be a really nice point to do a, a bit of a review, a state of the nation, if you like, around foodborne disease, and maybe something we could, um, we could look on. Who knows? Maybe the new chief scientists might fancy doing their next CSA's report in this area. I don't like to volunteer him before he's here, but... Yeah, he's right. <laughs> Um, and I expect Chris is rolling his eyes about the pressure on resources for the next paper and we're coming up with new things to do. Um, Emily, you have been really involved in the small abattoir discussion, I think. Do you want to start on that? Yes. I mean, really involved is, is to completely overstate my role. Actually, I, I want to pay tribute to Glenn Portman, who is our colleague who died in, um, in I think late February, early March, who has done a huge amount, who did a huge amount on this. And Martin Evans as well, who's been very closely involved with those um, working on small avatars. But I wanted to get a couple of things off my chest about it and then pass over to Martin. So the thing I am worried about small avatars and the, the collection of things that they are facing at the moment, which I think puts some of the businesses at risk and uh, some of the uh, market forces that are going on um, and some of the regulatory requirements are hitting them in various different ways. And they don't all sit with the FSA, but we, um, with a presence on the ground in our meat hygiene inspection and official vets, often become the face of government to small avatars. So we hear about all the different things that are going on. Um, and, and I mean, Mary referred to the question about particular ways that official controls are run on meat hygiene to these official vets. But there are also animal welfare requirements that DEFRA own, whether that's mandatory CCTV, which has required capital investment, or stunning equipment that has required capital investment that are requirements DEFRA has set that we're enforcing on their behalf. And then there's the market forces as well. And I was hearing recently um, from Sustain and others about the price of hides and skins falling down and therefore that now being a waste product. So that's an additional cost to get those disposed of. So there are a nexus of things. For me, this is where we need to join up um, with other parts of government to see what we can do collectively to assist. Um, what the FSA is doing, and Martin can say more, is really looking at the way that we run our official controls and our operational transformation programme is has got in it things that we hope will help. That includes um, being able to run the controls um, for less cost because we'll be using our skilled resource in different ways. And it also includes potentially a segmentation to risk. So, you know, you can have earned autonomy and therefore it's slightly cheaper. Um, but Martin perhaps could say a bit more. Yes, thanks, Emily. Uh, and thanks for the question, Mary. Bizarrely, um, sitting in front of me is the report as well. So, um, And I keep reading through it and I'm looking at the different um, recommendations that are in there. Um, and I do think that uh, some of the focus in that report is slightly mis misguided, but there's some really good points for us to work on. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, as Emily says, as a group working with DEFRA, working with the Sustainable Food Trust, working with the craft, National Craft Butchers, um, on ways of working uh, more coherently uh, and Glenn was a wonderful uh, asset to that and we're working very closely with them. The, the, the issue for me is it, multi-issued, uh, it isn't just one part, we, we deliver death for the policyholders for some parts of this. We have a, a regular meeting and that's coming up on the 25th of June where death for colleagues and, and the Sustainable Food Trust will all attend um, and that, that what I'll, I'll say is that COVID, for, us, for really interesting, has been as an exceptional igniter of small abattoirs. And what I mean by that is far more people are shopping locally. Far more people have realised the value of uh, what they can buy from their local butchers and where their local butcher gets their meat from. So, so some of these smaller abattoirs are 100% busier than they ever were. And it's how much stays as we begin to go back to, to what the world looked like before. So it's an interesting where we are at the moment and we're going to keep close eye on it and see where we can help and assist. I've said to them many times and I'll, I'll pull it on public um, remit now as well. I don't think the cost of an OV is the biggest issue for a small abattoir that, as Emily said, highs and skins. 
uh, all the byproducts, a whole different number number of issues that we're working through with them. So we'll see where it goes, but we'll, we'll, we're working very closely with as many different parts of the, the industry as we can. I do think it's important. I think what you've done, Martin, over the last couple of years, and Glenn, has been really significant. And I've heard a lot of positive feedback from the stakeholders that you and Emily have mentioned about your leadership, your contribution there. But this is not an FSA policy area. We do not have responsibility for the viability of small abattoirs. So I do think we need to encourage DEFRA to take responsibility for resolving that viability issue. There are lots of things that we can do to help, but ultimately it's not our job to ensure that small abattoirs survive. However sympathetic we, we might be to the cause, um, and we've had a similar issue in the past around animal welfare when it, it started to look like the FSA was responsible for animal welfare policy. And we're not. We deliver controls on behalf of DEFRA. So I, I do think from a board perspective, being very clear that we, we want to do what we can to enable that sector to support consumer choice, diversity, meet consumer expectations effect, as effectively as possible is really important but it's not for us to lead the charge on its economic viability. That's a really important element of it. Um, so I just thought it's, it's quite important that we are clear about where our mission begins and ends on that. Um, we have got uh, some comment from Mark and from Ruth. So that really quick question, if I might, for uh, really my own education to some extent. The local authority performance slide, uh, Chris, probably, uh, talks about hygiene uh, matters, but one of the local authorities listed at stage three is Northamptonshire County Council, who as an upper tier authority wouldn't normally be responsible for food hygiene matters. I just wondered if there's something special in that area that, that brings them into that scope. Um, who wants to pick that up? Uh, Maria. Sorry, Heather, I didn't have time to virtually put my hand up there. <laughs> I think it's probably just a typo, Mark. I think it's both. So we look at the lanes returns. Whenever we're looking at the lanes returns, it's about um, it's about both hygiene and standards. And um, so I think that's just um, a misleading in terms of how the slides laid out. And we can look at that and take it away. Apologies. Thank you. Ruth? Uh, I actually had a, a question on that same slide and I think I'm right in saying that both the local authorities at stage three were there before COVID um, and I just wondered given that we recognise the pressures on local authorities whether we had uh, some agreement as to how uh, they would act upon the communications they've had with the FSA and a pathway to de-escalation of that priority? Thanks, Ruth. Happy to pick that one up as well, Heather. Um, believe it or not, that you're right, Ruth. We have um, this is quarter four, so this is um, up until the end of March. And um, since that time, we have been in contact with both local authorities, and we've been continuing to monitor their progress. I think it has actually um, COVID nineteen has probably given them a little bit of space to be able to um, do some more work. So we have positive reports back from both of those authorities. Um, and I think we are uh, um, look, looking at de-escalation at some stage quite soon. Thank you. I think that's it on the performance and resources report. Thank you very much, Chris and colleagues. Uh, we're moving on to the COVID-19 business prioritization, prioritization report here, which I think Sam, looking for him to nod, is going to lead on. Excellent. I just want to be, uh, just, just in terms of our external audience, the board doesn't normally get involved in detailed allocation of resources. That's for the chief executive and her executive team to, to do. But we are consulted and we do make an input into setting the annual business plan. And because of COVID-19, even though we've only just set that, it has to be revisited. So this is a chance for the board just to confirm that we agree with the reprioritization and it's still as closely as it can honours our priorities uh, that we set um, only a few months ago. Sam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so as, as Heather alluded to, the paper is designed to provide the board with assurance that given the pressures that COVID-19 has placed on the organisation, 
we've examined our proposed work plans for the year and we do remain committed to delivering as much as possible that was in those original plans. Uh, EMT have undertaken a clear prioritisation of our work and it's laid out in paragraphs 3.1 to 3.4 of the paper. This places COVID-19 and EU exit as the highest priority areas that the organisation is dealing with at the moment. As you'll appreciate, the third bucket within 3.1 of other FSA work itself contains a hierarchy of other work that we do across our programmes, our business plans, and then within our business as usual activity. The impact of COVID-19 on our cross-cutting programmes is laid out in paragraph 3.3 and in Annex 1. And it's fair to say that in some of these programmes, a significant amount of work has been affected, as Emily alluded to earlier in the Chief Executive's report to the board. However, in a number of cases, we also believe that we'll be able to still deliver a large amount of this work within the year. So although it has been delayed, we remain confident of hitting the majority of our delivery milestones prior to March 2021. I'd also just like to draw the board's attention to paragraphs 3.5 and 3.6. These show the underspend that we're forecasting due to COVID-19 that's predominantly been driven by associated delays to delivering some work, uh, delays for recruitment, and also a reduced a reduction in our carbon subsistence expenditure. However, I'd also like to make the board aware that the demand for the use of this money is already outstripping the available funding that we have. We have a long pipeline of work that we do need to continue to prioritise, and we will do this in line with uh, the priorities that EMT have set and, and kind of hopefully agreed by the board, and we'll make sure we continue to use any of the available funding prudently and to ensure we use value for money. Uh, so. Quickly, I'd just like to wrap up by inviting the board to provide any comments and agreement that the prioritisation as undertaken by MT is reflective of the priorities that the board has for the organisation and just to know how we'll continue to use the available funding that might come available. Sam, thank you very much. And I, obviously the business committee at its regular meetings will be able to scrutinise how that's going. Dave. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I have just a couple of um, comments, one of which might be half a question, let's see. Um, uh, I mean, it's encouraging to see in 3.7 that um, we've got these additional funds that we haven't got um, allocated at the moment and we're going to make sure we do spend them wisely. I guess the question or half question around it is, um, are we able to bring in any additional resources to help us, particularly if we can think of some investments which will um bring financial benefits in future years um and I'm, I'm sure we've done this i'm just seeking assurance really that a crisis can sometimes encourage people to run towards it um so to make sure that we've got the appropriate level of resources um still working on covid19 um uh, rather than um allowing people um, to, to think that's the most important area to make their contribution to the organisation. Thank you for that. I need to take uh, Mary and Margaret's questions and then come back to you. So, so Jim, slightly follows on from what Dave said um, in terms of um, investment. Um, uh, we've spoken about the streamlining that potentially we streamlining and avoiding incremental degradation in terms of the regulatory environment. Will any of those that streamlining require investment, and have we factored that in? And also a specific point on we talk about sort of three months delay in delivery for food hypersensitivity. We have spoken about the importance of hitting the sort of late summer period, early autumn period in terms of the 16 to 24 year olds who are, we hope, uh, even at this time, going to be experiencing their first taste of food freedom away from their families and whether we're still going to be able to hit that milestone. Thank you. And Margaret? Absolutely. That was my question. I feel that that is a generation that are increasingly being disenfranchised. Um, COVID is going to hit them really hard economically. So a lot will not be going to be able, they'll be leaving school, leaving uni, not being able to get jobs, going into a recession. We've already heard, heard earlier on the board that the, um, <clears throat> the dynamics of the numbers who are going to have, or feel they're going to have more difficulty feeding themselves are going to be in there. And I don't think that, um, I know we say on um, the milestones of the food hypersensitivity slide that the young consumer awareness campaign, I don't think it can happen in the same kind of way so I don't know how deliverable that will be or how uh, or whether it will be more difficult now to target that group so that's just adding to Mary's point. 
Thank you. I'm going to pick up that one uh, first because uh, Rebecca can come back on that. And I know a lot of work has been going on to work out how we can maintain that momentum. Rebecca. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Um, yes. Yeah, so so just on that point about the campaigns, uh, th this is one of the aspects of the food hypersensitivity programme that has been most affected by COVID. Obviously, the, the whole environment into which we would be placing mm. these messages has completely changed. And we've been particularly conscious of the, the pressures on the hospitality industry uh, and the difficulty of reaching them at this time when, uh, when um, the majority of that industry is closed down. Um, but as you say, for, for young people, um, it's particularly important that we, that we reach them at a specific time of year. And uh, although it's a little bit too soon to see how, um, for example, the, um, the university terms will be shaping up, um, you know, we, are, we are currently revising our plans. Uh, and that's one of the first things that we want to we want to reshape that precisely for those reasons that that you've just talked about. Um, if I could just add on food type sensitivity as well, although um, in the paper it mentioned that there's been a short delay to recruitment, uh, we we have been able to be one of the first areas to to restart uh, several weeks ago actually. Uh, and you'll be pleased to hear that we are now uh, appointing people to that team. So that's been really good, and we've had a really good response to our recruitment campaign there as well. Rebecca, you might just want to say the sort of scale of growth in that team, because I think that will give the board a lot of confidence that the commitment there still is to driving this area forward. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so, so from uh, uh, a team um, which, which was um, no more really than than uh, the equivalent of around two, three max full time people, um, we'll be recruiting up to twelve full time members of staff, including a couple of people. Um, uh, who'll be working on the the science and evidence base, which is which is a really important part of the development of the program going forward, uh, and that's happening right now. We've just appointed a couple of people. We've got recruitments underway now. Great, um, Sam. The other points. Thank you. So, um, picking up your first point, Dave, on external support to to continue to live our, our plans. When we went through the prioritisation, one of the things that we were really conscious of looking at was which parts of the organisation were impacted by COVID-19 and which parts which parts weren't because obviously it, it wasn't a, a universal impact and where that's happened so for example within the ABC program we've been able to get additional support and externally and use some of this funding to make sure that we continue, continue to deliver the parts of the program that aren't as dependent on the RCD director which was heavily affected by COVID-19 due to the local authority impact so where we have been looking at the, the shape of the programmes and, and the work to be delivered, we've tried to seek out where those things aren't directly affected and continue to push those on as quickly as we can, um, using external support where possible. And then your, your second point around um, ensuring we continue to resource COVID-19 as effectively and, and fully as possible. Um, absolutely, yes. I'll, um, I think Colin covered it earlier, but I'll maybe pause and guess he wants to come in here. But we're still running some of the structures around the COVID-19 incident and, and as they eventually start to unwind, we will make sure that we continue to keep that kind of on everyone's key areas of focus and it remains the biggest priority of the organisation as we move forward. Yeah, if I can just add to that, yes, absolutely. It's the number one priority at present. Um, but uh, it, in terms of the frequency of meetings and the level of uh, new issues arising, they are significantly reducing. And as a result, um, not so many staff need to be uh, tied up in the incident. And, to, and sorry, Heather, just to supplement as well from my point of view. So one of the things um, I've learned from being around crises in government is that the environment agency rubric is a good one, which is to think big and act early. Um, it's better to have put more resource in than less when you're facing into something you don't know. The fact is we do know more about it now because we've had three months of this. And what Colin and Philip and others have been working on is a forward plan that gets this into a more kind of business as usual settled state. So lots of our crisis response activity, you know, frequent daily meetings, weekly meetings and so on, gets moved into ordinary business as usual, which is less resource intensive and starts being governed in the normal way and through the business. And the other thing in terms of bringing additional resource, so we have done that in a couple of places. The Achieving Business Compliance one is an example where we're using some consultants we're doing the same at the moment in the operational transformation programme. There, there are two um, limiting factors, though. One is senior bandwidth, because these uh, this in, in, input does need um, proper strategic direction, oversight of it, and um, that, that's essential. And the second uh, constraining factor is uh, dependencies, where, for example, we have dependencies on other 
um, local authorities, departments and so on. But given those two, we're seeing what we can do to bring in additional capacity. Thank you. I don't see any more questions from board members. So we are happy uh, to agree your prioritisation proposals and that they reflect uh, the board's position um, in terms of the situation we now find ourselves in. Thank you very much for that. Um, we had uh, only one piece of any, any of the business, which is another farewell. Uh, this is Martin's uh, last FSA business committee and board meeting. I don't think he envisaged finishing his career in this way. Uh, but Martin, I wanted to put on record the board's uh, significant appreciation for your contribution. Uh, your um, kind of combination of charm and substance and an inner core of steel has served us incredibly well in the difficult and challenging area of uh, working in uh, meat official controls. And we have benefited enormously from that combination of style and substance. So we wish you very well in your eventual retirement. We hope your wife has forgiven you for not actually uh, fulfilling your commitment to be gone some months ago. And we especially appreciate you being willing to finish your career by stepping up as you have done and giving us all a level of trust, confidence and support that I think has served consumers and the industry really well. So Martin, thank you very much indeed. Very kind of you, Heather, very kind. Yes, more virtual clapping. <laughs> and that brings to an end our business committee meeting and uh, the uh, uh, business of the board. Our next meeting takes place on Wednesday, the 26th of August and will be in this format again. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. And board members, please do feedback any observations on the way the meeting works in this format uh, so that we can see if we can improve it uh, for, for all our benefits uh, next time round. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye. <laughs>